We're live, Pedro. Uh, at this time, would all sergeants please start your recordings? PC recording is up. Cloud is ready. Thank you. Sergeant Jones, you may begin your opening statement. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? And to minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And we are ready to begin. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Levin. I am the chair of the Committee on General Welfare. I apologize for the delay. We're having some technical technical difficulties on my end. <clears throat> um, I want to thank everybody for joining us to this hearing on the Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, the committee will be conducting an oversight hearing to examine the racial disparities in the child welfare system. It is well established that significant disparities persist for children and families of color, especially black families, both around the country and despite much improved practices across city agencies in New York City as well. These disparities persist through each stage of the child welfare process, from investigation through mitigation and removal. And while Black and Hispanic slash Latinx children comprise 61.3% of the total New York City population, they comprise 87.8% of the children in investigation. Black children make up a disproportionate amount of those placed into foster care, comprising 53.8%, while only making up 24.3% of the city's youth population. Black children also experience longer stays in the foster care system and are exiting the system slower than they are entering. Black families are also less likely to receive community-based services and are the most likely to receive no services at all. The city must do more to ensure that these disparities are addressed with the urgency and bold action they necessitate. All families, regardless of, of their race or income level who have been involved with the child welfare system deserve equal and equitable treatment and access to the support and services that they need to thrive. The committee will seek an update on the equity action plan put forth by ACS, which includes action items to address disparities within the child welfare system. The committee will examine best practices in order to improve outcomes for children and families of color and to hear of reforms the city could make to the child welfare system to address these disparities. In addition, the committee would like to learn more about the movement to abolish and rebuild the child welfare system in order to ensure that it is equitable and fair for all families served. I want to thank all the advocates and members of the public who are joining us today. I want to thank our colleagues um, in ACS and members of the administration uh, who are uh, here to testify today. Uh, I want to also acknowledge um, the committee staff who have worked on uh, this hearing today. I'm into Kilowan, our senior legislative counsel, Crystal Pond, our senior, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omery, our policy analyst, and Daniel Krupp, our senior finance analyst. I also want to thank Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director, and Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff. Um, and uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, council members who are here this morning, uh, members of the committee. We have Council Member Grudenchik. Um, and Council Member Holden is here. Uh, we're also joined by Council Member Lander. Um, and Council Member Adams, um, and I'm sure that we will be joined by other council members as they join us. I also want to thank um, Sergeant at Arms um, uh, for um, for bringing this hearing together, and Joanna Castro, um, who uh, has 
uh, runs our uh, all of the hearings uh, here virtually. So I want to thank all that staff as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Council of the Committee, Amanda Kilowan. Thank you, Chair Levin. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the General Welfare Committee of the New York City Council. I'm going to be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. At that point, you will be unmuted by the host. I'm gonna be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I'm periodically going to be announcing who the next panelists are going to be. And the first panel we are going to have is going to be the members of the administration. Commissioner David Hansel of ACS and present for questions and answers, Dr. Jacqueline Martin, Alan Sputz, Julie Farber, Dale Joseph, Tyler James, William Fletcher, and Andrew White. Again, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and either Chair Levin or I will call on you in order. And just as a heads up, we're going to be limiting council member questions to five minutes, and that's going to include answers. So now I'm going to call on members of the administration to testify. Before I do so, I'd like to administer the oath to the administration. At this point, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Levin, members of the Committee on General Welfare. Uh, I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Um, I have a number of colleagues with me today, and I'd like to introduce them. We want to make sure that uh, we can answer all of your questions. Um, with me today are Tyler James, Director of Race Equity Strategies, and Dale Joseph, Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Community Engagement and Partnerships. They are both in our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing. Uh, we have with us Dr. Jacqueline Martin, who's Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Prevention Services, William Fletcher, Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Child Protection, Alan Sputz, Deputy Commissioner for our Family Court Legal Services Division, Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Family Permanency Services, and Andrew White, who is Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Policy Planning and Measurement. We at ACS are grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation today with you with the council and with our partners in child welfare. It has been a difficult year to say the least as we all grapple with the global COVID-19 pandemic. And as we continue to see and feel the deep rooted and pernicious effects of racism in our society. Each of these national crises impacts us greatly on personal and professional levels. And I want to acknowledge and offer condolences to so many who've experienced trauma and loss in recent months. As a first step towards healing, it's crucial to have conversations like the one we're having today, where we can take an honest and transparent look at the challenges we face and how we can respond to them. ACS seeks to administer equitable child welfare and juvenile justice services and systems in which a child or a family's race ethnicity, national origin, immigration status, gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation do not predict how they fare. Within New York City and nationally, Black, African American, and Latinx Hispanic families have long been overrepresented at key points along child welfare pathways. To develop our equity action plan, we conducted an equity assessment that looked at the disparities at key stages in the child welfare system. This written testimony includes an updated chart that shows how black African-American and Latinx and Hispanic families experience the child welfare system in New York City differently at every key decision point as compared with white and Asian families. We know that we have essential work to do to address racial inequities within ACS and in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. We must identify and address structures, policies, and practices that present barriers to families getting the services that they need. While ACS has a commitment to supporting and strengthening families as the best way to keep children safe, 
we must confront the unintended negative consequences of our involvement on the experiences of families and communities. Focusing on racial disparities is something that I have prioritized since becoming ACS commissioner. We've built on ACS's longstanding work in this area, including our Racial Equity and Cultural Competence Committee, or the REC. The REC brings together a diverse representation of ACS staff, external stakeholders, and professionals to promote racial equity throughout the child welfare, juvenile justice, and early childhood systems. The REC volunteers contribute invaluably to ACS's work by establishing a racial equity framework for our data analysis, our training policies, and workforce development. Building on this foundation, I created the Office of Equity Strategies in 2017 because I believe it is crucial to have dedicated staff who are focused specifically on addressing inequities, disparities, and systemic racism, both internally at ACS and externally in our work with communities. As the council is aware, ACS has since developed and is implementing our equity action plan to examine and address the ways in which our work disproportionately impacts children and families of color. Today, I'll be explaining our findings at each of the key stages in the child welfare system as shown in the chart in much more detail. And you'll hear updates on our strategic responses and actions to achieve and sustain progress on each of them as we implement our equity action plan. As required by local law 174 of 2017, we'll be submitting our equity action plan update this summer. And we're happy to have the opportunity today to share key highlights from our work. I'll then talk about additional strategies and collaborations that we have in place to move ACS forward as a more racially equitable and anti-racist organization. Let me begin with disparities among children in investigations or SCR reports. As you know, ACS is legally required to respond to all reports that the statewide central register, the SCR accepts and assigns to us. In a typical year, the state refers more than 50,000 cases involving about 70,000 children to ACS for investigation. After investigation, our child protective staff um, may find some credible evidence of abuse or maltreatment. And, and if they do, they then uh, indicate about a third of those reports. The remaining roughly two thirds are unfounded. It is deeply concerning to us that year after year, there are racial and ethnic disparities in the reports ACS receives from the state and is required to investigate. Most notably, we see that Black, African American, and Latinx Hispanic children are significantly over overrepresented in those reports. Let me give you some data. In calendar year 2019, 41.4% of SCR reports involve children and families who identified as Black or African American, even though these children only make up about 23% of the New York City child population. 45.4% of reports involve children and families who identified as Latinx or Hispanic, but those children represent about 36.4% of the New York City child population. On the other hand, while 26.5% of New York City children are white and 14.1% are Asian or Hispanic Islander, these families make up only 8% and 5.3% respectively of reports to the SCR that are accepted by the state for investigation. While the SCR may be an essential lifeline for children when they are being seriously harmed or are at imminent risk of harm, the child protective response and investigation by its nature can be intrusive and traumatic for families. We have a collective duty to make sure this government intervention is sought and used only when there is a true concern for the safety of a child or imminent risk to a child, and that it is not used inappropriately or disproportionately, resulting in further margin, marginalization and trauma for families of color. While ACS does not have control over reports that are called in and that the state accepts and refers to us, we are taking numerous steps towards addressing disparities among families that are reported to the SCR given that the largest racial and ethnic disparity we see is at this initial 
crucial point. So the key strategies we're undertaking include, number one, using a primary prevention approach to reduce the number of reports in communities with historically high reporting levels. Number two, collaborating with mandated reporter agencies and organizations to reinforce alternate ways of connecting families with help when needed. And number three, advocating for policy changes to reduce unnecessary and discriminatory utilization of the SCR process. Let me talk about each of these strategies in some more detail. First of all, our primary prevention efforts are focused on strengthening families and communities with resources and supports with the goal of reducing families interaction with the traditional child welfare system. This work includes child safety campaigns on important topics for parents like safe sleep practices, ensuring homes are equipped with window guards, medication safety, reminders to keep common hazards like hand sanitizer out of the reach of young children, uh, all the things that parents need to know to keep their kids safe. In addition to our safety campaigns, we support 11 community partnerships throughout the city and three family enrichment centers, the FECs. And both the FECs and the community partnerships provide a space for local organizations to network with each other and share critical information and resources to support children and their families. They also give parents and caretakers and community leaders the opportunity to get to know each other in a safe and nurturing environment, providing positive outlets for children and youth, and notably, they have adapted to provide more concrete resources to families throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Through these community hubs that families have come to rely upon and trust, we've been able to provide families with groceries, clothing, even emergency grants, so that they could remain more stable, supported, and safe during this challenging time. The FECs operate in neighborhoods that have historically experienced high rates of reported child abuse and neglect. East New York and Brooklyn, and Highbridge and Hunts Point in the Bronx. The FECs are open to all community residents, and as members, they participate in community-designed offerings that are intended to bolster a range of protective factors. The FECs operate with a keen focus on parent voices, and it's these parents who have co-designed the centers, including everything from the name of the site, to the color of the walls, to the programming that's offered. This past summer, ACS released a report on the first evaluation we've done of the FECs, which found that the FEC offerings are having a positive effect on members' social supports from family, friends, and neighbors, family functioning, emotional connection to their children, and their outlook on life. Additionally, those surveyed reported significant increases in their access to advice and resources in addressing several life challenges like parenting, financial issues, relationships, food and nutrition issues, and stress management. As another strategy to make sure that families are not overreported, we are working closely with the state and mandated reporters so that professionals working with children and families understand the many ways to assist families and connect them with resources without the need for a report to the SCR. For example, prior to the pandemic, ACS's Child Protective Borough offices were working closely with schools in their local communities that were high reporters to create strategies to reduce unnecessary reports. Since the start of the pandemic, we've collaborated with the Department of Education to develop guidance that the DOE issued to its staff to help them make decisions about reporting. This guidance makes clear that if a family is struggling with technology or other COVID-19 related challenges, the DOE should work with the family to provide assistance without calling the SCR. Guidance was initially distributed in April and then updated in September to account for the addition of hybrid learning in the fall. Just last week, with, uh, because of the advocacy of ACS and others, the State Office of Children and Family Services, which administers the SCR, announced that the state is taking steps to curb unwarranted educational neglect reports by implementing stronger screening procedures and training for the SCR hotline operators when educational neglect reports are called in. The state's new guidance is also aimed 
at ensuring that students, that schools have assisted students with technology and other resources to remediate remote or hybrid learning challenges before the state accepts a report for a county to investigate. We're extremely pleased to see the state adopt this approach, which is consistent with what we have been doing in New York City throughout the pandemic. Similarly, ACS has been working very closely with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Health and Hospitals so that hospital and other medical staff understand the impact that SCR reporting has on families and that calls should be made only when there is a concern about a child's safety. ACS and our sister agencies have been reiterating to health professionals that if a parent or a child tests positive for a substance when the child is born, either public or voluntary hospital staff should not call the SCR solely based upon a positive test if there's no impact on child safety or well being, and that they can make service referrals without contacting the SCR. In addition to our collaboration with mandated reporter entities, we're advocating for three statewide reforms. First, we're urging the state to require implicit bias training for mandated reporters, like the requirement we have in place for all ACS staff. We know that every person holds attitudes and beliefs that are shaped by their upbringing, culture, and life experiences. Especially when making important decisions that affect children and families, it is crucial to guard against implicit biases that may influence our perceptions and interpretations and make sure that reports are objective. Second, we're urging the state to enhance its screening procedures to make sure that the SCR only accepts allegations that clearly articulate harm or risk of harm to a child. And the recently announced changes in handling educational neglect reports I just mentioned are a step in the right direction. And we hope the state will continue to build on this approach. Third, we're encouraging the state to implement stronger mechanisms to screen out reports that are clearly fraudulent or harassing. Given the data showing that Black, African American, and Latinx Hispanic families are disproportionately reported to the SCR, we believe these reforms are necessary to reduce intrusion to families when it's not necessary to protect the safety of a child, and that these reforms will help reduce the racial inequities in reporting and investigations. Moving on to the next stage, um, while the disparities in um, substantiated allegations are not as dramatic as those we see in reporting at the initial stage, there are in fact also modest disparities in substantiation of allegations. That is those where a child protective specialist investigates and finds some credible evidence that the allegation occurred. So to, to look at been with the data in calendar year 2019, 41.4% of reports ACS investigated involved Black African American families. 45% involved Latinx, um, I'm sorry, 42.6% uh, of those indicated reports involved Black Latinx families. 45, Black African American families, I'm sorry. 45.4% of investigations involved Latinx or Hispanic families, and slightly more, 45.9% of indicated reports involved Latinx or Hispanic families. So a modest uh, a disparity, but one that we are, are paying close attention to. So we're also taking a number of steps to try to address disparities in indication rates and to address the collateral consequences that are associated with having an indicated report. In addition to requiring implicit bias training for all ACS staff to aid in critical decision-making, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, two other key strategies are supporting SCR reform and expanding the use of CARES, uh, the acronym for Collaborative Assessment, Response, Engagement, and Support, which is ACS's state authorized alternative to child protective investigations. We believe that any child protective response must have an outcome that both promotes child safety and provides fairness and equity for families. ACS was proud and eager to support the recently passed state SCR reform bill. The law will help protect children 
while minimizing undue hardships for families and we're hard at work planning for implementation. Starting with investigations that commence on January 1st, 2022, the standard of evidence required to indicate a case will be changed from New York's current very low standard of some credible evidence to a fair preponderance of the evidence, which is more consistent with the indication burden of proof requirements that are used across the country. We believe that the indication burden of proof requirement, we believe this higher standard rather is fairer and will help us to address some of the implicit biases that we see in the child welfare system. The new law also reduces the length of time that an indicated case for maltreatment would be accessible to potential employers. Under pre-existing law, actually current law, an indicated case for abuse or maltreatment remains on a person's record for 10 years after the youngest child turns 18, regardless of the severity of the incident, which can have long-term destabilizing effects on a family. Under the new law, neglect records, not abuse records, will be sealed from employers if the record is eight years or older, which provides more economic pathways for parents and caregivers. And we're thrilled to see New York State take these important steps forward in addressing equity and child protective investigations. For those families who come to ACS's attention through SCI reports, we wanna make sure that our response is strength-based and led by the family's needs. By state statute, Family Assessment Response, or FAR, is an alternative child protective response to reports where there is no immediate or impending danger to children and where there are no allegations of child abuse. That response, the FAR response, does not include an investigation. It does not result in a determination of indicated or unfounded. Often referred to as a dual track or alternative track, this alternative response enables ACS to work with families to identify services they may need without suggesting, subjecting the family to an investigation. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, as the number of overall reports and investigations has decreased, ACS is increasingly using this alternative child protective response with about 5% of cases on this track so far in 2020, compared with 3.3% during the same period in 2019. As you may know, we recently announced that we're expanding this program in two ways. It will be citywide in, with units in all five boroughs by this coming January, 2021. And we're doubling the total number of units by December, 2021. We also are renaming the program, as I said, to be called Collaborative Assessment, Response, Engagement and Support, or CARES. And we're doing this because we've long felt that the acronym FAR did not adequately describe the program's approach or encourage parental engagement. So we sought input from ACS staff, from our parent advisory council, from parents who participated in FAR to generate ideas for a new name. And in fact, the name we ultimately chose, CARES, was suggested by a father who had participated in the FAR program as a reflection of what the program meant to his family when working with ACS. In CARES, Child Protective Specialists partner with the family to identify their needs, to educate the family about resources, to empower the family to make decisions that address their needs, and to connect families to the appropriate services. The CARES approach is family-centered, family-driven, and solution-focused. At ACS, CARES is a core strategy for combating racial disparity and promoting social justice for two reasons. First, the partnering approach is a less intrusive response for families, and it helps enable the family to drive solutions and service plans for themselves. Second, CARES offers an alternative to the traditional CPS investigation, which uh, traditionally ends with a determination of indicated or unfounded. And we think this acknowledges that we can promote child safety in these cases by promoting stronger family and community connections and wraparound supports rather than the traditional focus of making a determination about allegations and individual culpability. While child safety is always at the forefront of ACS's work, we're confident we can maintain safety while better serving many families across the city through the use and expansion of CARES. Third step in the process is access to prevention services. A close look at our data shows that while black African American families overall 
are the most likely racial or ethnic group to participate in prevention services. The subset of black African-American families with an indicated investigation are slightly less likely to participate in prevention services than Latinx or Hispanic families with an indicated investigation. It's a small disparity, but again, it's important that all New York City families have equitable access to and can benefit from prevention services. And that's why we identified it as a concern in our equity action plan and why we are employing strategies to address it. We are always working to make sure that families have the services and supports that they need to keep children safe and to reduce the need for foster care. Our nationally recognized prevention services continuum has in fact safely reduced the utilization of foster care in New York City. There were, as we've uh, mentioned previously, there were nearly 50,000 New York City children in foster care 25 years ago, 17,000 a decade ago. Today, there are fewer than 8,000 New York City children in foster care. Also, we have strong evidence that ACS prevention services reduce repeat involvement of families with the child welfare system. Families that successfully complete prevention services and more than 80% do, these families are five times less likely to have another substantiated investigation, one in which uh, there is evidence of child abuse or neglect in the following six months than families that do not complete services. And we know now that families feel that they are benefiting from the services. Um, earlier this year, we released results of our first ever prevention services survey, family experience survey, uh, and thank you to the council uh, for asking us to do this. The survey asked families receiving prevention services about their experiences. We found that about 94% of survey participants said that they were happy with the prevention services their families received. 71% said they would recommend the services to a family or a friend, and 86% uh, of the parents participating in the survey said prevention services that help them to reach their parenting goals. We have redesigned and strengthened our prevention services continuum with an equity frame in mind because prevention services belong to all New York City families who may need support, regardless of identity or background. And we want all families to view them this way uh, in our, and so in our redesign system, which launched with 119 new programs on July 1st, 2020, all families in New York City now have universal access to every service model we offer, regardless of where they live in the five boroughs. We've also infused more parent voice and choice into the service array and the services themselves. The services were designed with feedback from parents and providers are expected to fully incorporate parent voice when developing individual service plans. The new system also explicitly addresses racial equity by requiring prevention providers to incorporate efforts to address racial disparity in their organization and in service provision, including through the formation of racial equity committees that include all levels of staff representation. We believe that our newly redesigned system will strengthen access to evidence-based supports for families and help us address racial disparities in service access. Moving on to the next phase of child welfare involvement, which is court involvement and foster care. Um, we, as I have, have, have uh, repeatedly testified uh, before this committee, one of our paramount goals is to minimize family court interaction for families in order to keep children safe at home through engaging parents in prevention and other services. We focused on this among our equity priorities because the data again show that black African-American and Latinx Hispanic children are disproportionately represented in court ordered supervision filings, 44.4% and 46.2% respectively in calendar year 2019 and in foster care placements, 55.5% and 36.4% respectively, again, in calendar year 2019. We see in particular that the experience of black African-American children is different from other children. While black African-American children comprise 42.6% of all substantiated investigations in calendar year 2019, already a disproportionate amount compared with the overall population, they comprise 55.5% of all foster care placements and remained at 55.6% of the foster care population in that year. 
So this shows us clearly that we have much more work to do to critically examine decisions at each point in the case, and also to look at how we are supporting black African-American families and addressing the unique challenges and traumas they face, not just in the child welfare system, but in our society at large. We're committed to limiting court intervention and foster care placement whenever possible. Prior to the COVID-19 crisis, in which the family court has restricted its operations, only one in 10 ACS investigations went to family court. And the majority of those involve requests for court ordered supervision, not for placement in foster care. In calendar year 2019, ACS filed 23% fewer cases seeking court ordered supervision than in calendar year 2017. We also seek fewer removals as a child safety intervention with 14% fewer removals in calendar year 2019 than calendar year 2017. During the COVID-19 period, due to significant limitations in access to the family courts, we've expanded our work to focus on movement of children in foster care toward reunification with their families outside of the normal court process. ACS has been closely collaborating with legal advocates who represent parents and children and our foster care provider agencies to help expedite safety and permanency outcomes for children despite the limited hearings being held virtually by the family court. We're affirmatively reviewing and identifying cases where steps toward reunification are safe and in the child's best interest, and we've reached consensus decisions to expand visits, to lift orders of protection, or to reunify children from foster care on a trial or final basis. If all the parties agree, we present these resolutions to the court for approval without the need to wait for restricted court hearings. And in this way, we've continued prioritizing safe and timely reunifications and reducing length of stay in foster care. Addressing overall court filings and removals is a necessary step and we must also dig deeper. When foster care is our necessary but last resort as a protective intervention for children, we must do everything we can to provide more equitable experiences and outcomes for the child and the family. Chair Levin and the council have been great partners in driving our work forward through the Interagency Foster Care Task Force. The important initiatives that originated from that group are being aggressively implemented through our foster care strategic blueprint. We've achieved measurable positive results, all of which tie to more equitable outcomes for children and families, including fewer children in foster care, reduced length of stay in foster care, increased kinship care placements for children, and additional use of kinship guardianship to achieve permanency. Most recently, again, just last week, I was thrilled to announce that we are launching a new parent advocate initiative called Parents Supporting Parents to improve reunification and racial equity outcomes as part of our effort to expand parent voice across all of our programs. These parent advocates will be crucial allies to empower parents and help dismantle bias and oppression in the foster care system by bringing their lived experience to strengthening parents' self-advocacy and their voice within the process and shifting organizational culture to more authentic parent engagement approaches. We've raised funds from major national and local foundations to launch a pilot that we will lay the groundwork for full implementation with our new foster care contracts on July 1st, 2022. In the initial pilot, two foster care agencies will have on staff 10 parent advocates with lived experience in the system who will be central members of their case planning teams working with parents to achieve reunification. So all the work I've described, we think, is essential to transforming our relationships with children and families, but our efforts must begin within and at home. To combat systemic racism in the child welfare system, we at ACS need to look internally at our own structures, policies, practices, and implicit biases. We must walk the walk if we want to build a culture and empower our staff to fight racial disproportionality in our work. To look critically at our role, we developed our Understanding and Undoing Implicit Bias Learning Program 
These courses help staff identify the connection between institutional racism, structural inequity, and implicit bias, and begin to surface and address implicit bias in decision-making and in conversations with coworkers. All of our child protective staff now learn about implicit bias as part of the core training they take when they begin their jobs. All of our direct service employees and supervisors at ACS are now required to take a full day instructor-led program on implicit bias, which we quickly adapted to make virtual in response to COVID-19. And we've also launched a new e-learn course that is mandatory for all ACS employees to complete, including me. Actually, I've taken the full day course as well. To date, more than 6,400 ACS staff have completed the e-learn and 1,559 have completed the all-day implicit bias course. And we strongly believe it's crucial for every member of the ACS staff to recognize and be equipped with strategies to deal with implicit bias. A strong, critical thinking and learning culture, which includes implicit bias training, will help ACS unpack and address the disparities that we see at the crucial points in our child welfare response that I've described. We're also continuing to infuse parent and youth voice within our policies, procedures, and service arrays. We created the new role of parent engagement specialist last year to increase the voice of parents with lived experience in all aspects of our work around practice, policy, and programming. Our parent engagement specialist, Sabre Jackson, supports the Parent Advisory Council, which meets regularly and shares recommendations with ACS leadership, including me, regularly. We're working tirelessly with the PAC not only to hear their voices, but to listen and to learn. The PAC members challenge us to do better, and I want to thank them for their candor, their leadership, and their thoughtfulness. We also have a Youth Leadership Council, or YLC, that includes youth who have experienced the foster care or juvenile justice systems, as well as peer mentors with prior system experience. The YLC also meets regularly, also coordinates with other youth councils to identify, prioritize, and inform program area leadership about key issues and recommendations for improving service and outcomes for young people. And finally, in order to advance our vision of establishing an equitable and fair child welfare and juvenile justice system, ACS is committed to working toward becoming an anti-racist organization that rejects all forms of racism and oppression, which again requires taking a close look internally. Many ACS divisions have been participating in what we call race, diversity, and intersectionality reflective process, a framework for collective reflection and discussion about the impact of power, privilege, and oppression of individuals, communities, practices, and policies. We regularly offer a two-day undoing racism workshop from the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond to help staff deepen our common knowledge, our common language, to understand racism, structural racism, racism and powered for ACS staff in 20, uh, 2006, and it integrates undoing racism principles, including historical content, developing leadership, maintaining accountability in our work, networking, analyzing power, and the child welfare practitioner as a gatekeeper. And uh, we are just beginning a partnership with the National Innovation Service, or NIS, to conduct an evaluation of our systems and activities as they relate to the racial equity experiences, needs, and priorities of frontline staff, families, and communities, and to identify key areas of intervention to drive system level change. Through a series of facilitated participatory design workshops and strategy sessions with families, community members, and our frontline staff, NIS will work with ACS to develop implementation plans for recommended strategies and to help develop the capacity of agency leadership and staff to support and execute on these plans. Racial disparity has been the legacy of the child welfare system, but it does not have to be its future. ACS is focused on placing equity at the center of every decision, policy, and initiative. I've described in great detail the specific initiatives we're implementing to address racial disparities because I believe we must go beyond platitudes towards concrete, measurable action. But as we build the capacity of our staff at all levels to respond effectively to structural racism and individual bias and to promote culturally competent policy and practice, we must also engage differently with youth, 
parents, families, and communities. We must listen even when it's difficult. We must collaborate even when it's complicated. And we must look critically at our own attitudes even when it's painful. As we continue to move forward and implement our equity action plan, I welcome our continuing conversations and partnerships with the city council, the child welfare community, and the families that we serve, all of which makes our work more transparent, more reflective of community voices and needs, and ultimately more successful. Thank you very much, and we will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Hansel. This time we're going to begin council member questions, but before we do, I'm going to need to swear in all members of the administration who may be answering any questions. I also want to remind members of the administration to remain unmuted throughout the question and answer session to prevent any technical difficulties. So at this point, I'm going to re-administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I, I do. do. Yes, I do. I do. Thank you, everyone. Now over to Chair Levin for questions. Thank you very much, Aminta. Um, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, just to, to council members that wish to ask questions, please use the raised hand function on Zoom. Um, and I'm happy to turn it over to you at that time. Um, Commissioner, I, I wanna thank you for, um, for the testimony and um, for the steps you've laid out as part of the equity action plan. Um, that ACS has undertaken. I think that it's it's um, pretty clear to me from um, the steps that you've laid out and um, uh, the overall comprehension, you know, the comprehensiveness of the of your testimony that ACS has been um, taking this seriously over the last several years. Um, and in a way, uh, you're wrestling with. Um, you know, decades and decades, if not centuries of, of institutional racism and structural racism um, uh, that have kind of led to this point. And so, um, and, and this is the first time that I can really recall where, um, where ACS has taken this on as a, um, as a priority um, because, um, you know, what, what we've seen over the years is that every time ACS has undertaken uh, uh, major reforms that has been in reaction to a, um, uh, you know, a child fatality and it's been um, usually driven from, by, from crisis to crisis. Um, and um, so I've said for, uh, I've thought for a while that that you know ACS is one agency in particular that needs to be in a constant state of reform um, and in a constant state of, of self evaluation, um, and and I think what you've described demonstrates that that's that's what um, ACS has been undergoing um, under your leadership. So I want to I want to commend you and your your team for that. Um, this is, you know, the, the issues that we're dealing with are so pervasive um, and um, so it's kind of hard to um, uh, identify where to start. But I think one thing that um, you mentioned that I, I, I appreciate um, uh, when I visited with uh, your CPS staff, um, maybe a 18 months ago or so in Williamsburg um, uh, and was in the room there with um, probably 40 or 50 CPS staff. Um, one thing that I, that stuck with me from that meeting was um, when, when uh, one CPS um, stood up and said, you know, they receive the implicit bias training. Um, they're, aware you know they they're they're aware of of this kind of structural bias um against black and brown families but they don't see that same type of training with mandated reporters and 
you know, there are how many hundreds of thousands of mandated reporters in New York City? Every healthcare worker, every school professional. Um, you know, it is it's, it's a very expansive um, uh, you know range of people, um, and you mentioned a state. Uh, you know, this this uh, ACS is in support of a state state legislation to require that. Um, how would something like that even be implemented? Because we're talking about, you know, it's one thing to do it for the staff of ACS that you have some real um, engagement with in an ongoing way. How do you do that for on that kind of wider basis? Because it's one thing to, to have this be part of the mission of ACS. How do we, the, with mandated reporters, you're kind of, you're trying to make it part of the mission of society at large. Um, and, um, and how do you do that? Um, well, if, I appreciate the question. If, if I could, I'd actually, uh, Chair Levin, I'd like to just say something on, on your first point about uh, sort of ACS's response to crisis, because um, I appreciate that. And I, um, I think, you know, we, and I, I've talked about this in previous hearings before this committee, um, really in a kind of a more general response to a way that we do our work, not specific to uh, race equity issues. Um, we have tried very hard to move ACS away from crisis response to individual situations uh, and more towards what you described, which I completely agree with as an agency that is in the process of continuous reform. Um, we know that the work we do is too important not to uh, have opportunity, always have opportunities for improvement and not to always be identifying opportunities for improvement, but we need to do that based on not just individual incidents, which often provoke a crisis response that may not be the right, right response, but in response to really data analysis and, and communication with the people who are affected by the work that we do. And I think I've talked previously before this committee about uh, the safety science approach that we've adopted over the last couple of years at ACS, where we really have tried to do a much more uh, thoughtful and uh, careful and kind of data-based um, analysis of and response to uh, uh, incidents that happen and to make sure that the, the way that we are changing our policies and changing our practices um, is truly informed by what will make a difference in terms of improving the way that we do our work. So um, that to me is really sort of, a, 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 I, I think, a fundamental change that we've made at ACS away from crisis response and really more towards um, ongoing, thoughtful, data-based reform. And I think that's the approach that we should and are trying to bring to our work around race equity as well. With regard to your question about mandated reporters, um, you know, mandated reporters are, are, are defined categories in state law. There are clearly defined categories of professionals that have mandated reporter uh, uh, re requirements. Um, and there are many of them, certainly. Yes, there are tens or perhaps hundreds of thousands of individuals who fall into those mandated reporter categories. But they're all, almost all of them are, um, you know, certified, trained professionals in some area or not another. And we don't think that it would be particularly difficult or onerous um, to add implicit bias training to those requirements in the same way we've added it to our training requirements for our own staff. Um, we would be more than happy, uh, and in fact, we have offered to the state, to the Office of Children and Family Services, uh, to make the trainings we developed uh, available to them to use. And so we think this is something that the state could do, uh, could do either by, you know, statute or, or just, I think, we could be done because OCFS uh, and the state actually regulate the mandated reporter training. They set the requirements for mandated reporters and the standards. Um, so we think they could fairly easily add this as a standard requirement for anyone who falls into a mandated reporter category. So yes, it would be some additional uh, you know, time burden for those, for those uh, individuals, but I think given the magnitude of the impact that SCR reporting has on children and families, um, it, is, it would be well worth it and something that would be a fairly uh, fairly modest and easy change for the state to make. Mm -hmm. um, and I apologize if I'm jumping around, um, you know, kind of within the, the timeline of, of, um, of ACS interventions, but um, I'm going to do that. I apologize in advance. Um, one thing that I, uh, that jumped out at me in reviewing uh, for the hearing was the data that came out of um, out of your your action report, um, 
that when a case is indicated and is is going before a judge at the, at some point, white families have a much higher rate of court ordered supervision following indicated investigation than black families and black families have a much higher rate of foster care placement. And that leads me to the question of what type of implicit bias training are ACS attorneys getting? And what type of implicit bias training are judges getting, family court judges? Um, because that's, you know, that's a different that's a different stage in the investigation. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me say a few things, and I'll ask um, a Deputy Commissioner uh, Alan Sputz for our Family Court Legal Services to speak specifically about the training his staff and the judges are receiving. Um, this, as I said in the testimony, this is something we are we are concerned about. We are trying to reduce overall uh, the rates of supervision, the rates of family court involvement, and the rates of foster care entry um, for all children. Um, of, of regardless of race. Um, and we think that the, the, the steps that we're taking to do that um, hopefully will have an impact across the board, but will have a, the most significant impact on the disparities we're most concerned about, which is uh, the um, disproportionately high rate of African, black African-American children entering foster care uh, and, and not quartered supervision. So um, we have a number of things in place uh, to, um, to reduce um, uh, any kind of family court access uh, involvement that would lead to one of those two outcomes, family a court over supervision or um, or um, uh, entry into foster care. Um, and we're doing that, obviously, prevention services is our is our uh, you know fundamental um, intervention to try to keep children safely at home and provide the support to the parents to avoid having to get into any kind of legal involvement. And through our new prevention services uh, system, which has been in place now for about four months, um, we are one of the things that we're focused on is earlier engagement of prevention services providers with families as a way of forestalling the need to seek family court intervention or either supervision or, or uh, foster care entry. So um, what we are doing with our new prevention providers, and actually this is building on uh, essentially sort of a pilot that we'd had in place for a year, a year and a half before the new programs went into effect. What we are now will be doing is um, at a situation where we've identified a, a, a serious concern with a family and uh, want to uh, work with the parents to engage in services. Typically, the, the stage in the process uh, where we have that conversation with families is a child safety conference. And what we are now going to begin doing is um, involving our preventive providers at that stage to connect with families then in the hope that if we can connect families with the right kind of prevention services and the families agree to engage in those services, that will forestall our need to go to court to seek either supervision or, um, or placement in foster care. Um, the pilot that we had done, which we called kind of, an, we called it enhanced, uh, enhanced preventive, um, actually we found was very effective in diverting hundreds of families that we might otherwise have to have gone to, uh, to court uh, to seek um, some kind of uh, court, court intervention. Uh, to avoid having to do that by engaging them with preventive services at the at the child safety conference stage. So we've now made that um, a fundamental part of our entire prevention system. And we're very hopeful that that will succeed in, in um, diverting hundreds, potentially thousands of cases that might otherwise have required family court involvement um, to preventive interaction at an earlier stage. So um, I think that, uh, I think that, there, the do, you things data, that do, do, do you have any kind of data from <clears throat> maybe calendar year 19 about how many, uh, how would you, how would you measure that, that diversion rate or how effective the, the, the preventive is as a, as a diversion from, um, you know, court involved? Yeah, we do have data on that, which we can provide to the committee. Um, that was something we tracked very carefully because we wanted to uh, we wanted to assess whether we thought it was effective enough, so that when we uh, you know uh, implemented our new set of uh, prevention programs, we would make it basically an institutional part of the entire system. So we can provide those those data to you. Um, the one other thing, uh, I'll, before I, I'm sorry, were you going to go ahead? Okay, I, I was just going to actually uh, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll okay. Answer. 
the only thing, and then with regard to the court system, I, I think as you probably know, uh, the office, of, the state office of court administration, um, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, completed a review and a report on uh, racial inequity within the entire court system across the state of New York, but including the family courts. That was conducted by um, uh, former uh, Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson from the Obama administration, who's now uh, an attorney, and his team. Um, and that report um, basically acknowledges some pretty serious issues around uh, racial disparities and racial inequities in the court system. Um, and because that has recently been issued, I think it's something the courts will be very focused on and there may be opportunities to engage with them about ways to address those issues specifically within the court system and, and court process. And that's something, I mean, we're, we're taking a very close look at that report. We actually were uh, interviewed by the, uh, the team that conducted that, that uh, report. And, uh, and so I think, I think there's an opportunity there to engage the courts around, around these issues as well. Uh, if, um, if, if, if I, I'd, I'd like to give uh, Deputy sure. Commissioner Sputz an opportunity to talk specifically about the training that our, our yeah. attorneys are, are undertaking. So, yeah. Yes, good afternoon. Um, and, and as the commissioner, I believe, mentioned in his testimony, um, the agency is doing um, e-learning, implicit bias training, as well as in-person uh, bias training. And uh, the commissioner considers uh, the attorneys as frontline staff. So all of the attorney, um, all of the attorneys in uh, ACS um, are doing the um, implicit bias training, both uh, e-learning and in person. I, th I think at, at, at this point, um, all but five of my attorneys uh, have completed the in-person um, training as well as the uh, online training. Um, I think we, we've also made a um, decision uh, in many or if not most instances where um, the, the uh, family court legal services attorneys are taking the in-person training along with um, CPS and, and uh, members of DCP. So um, not only are we thinking about the, the court piece, but also the investigative piece and making sure that, that we're um, you know, linking those uh, two pieces um, of staff, you know, because we, we, we uh, often have CPS testifying in court. And so we think it's important to take the training together. Um, we've also done, at least in one of our boroughs, reflective process. I think the commissioner mentioned that in his um, testimony as well. Um, I myself was the co-chair of the Racial Equity Committee for two years um, previously, and I've taken the undoing racism um, training that the commissioner mentioned, as well as uh, most, if not all, of my senior leaders have done the undoing uh, racism training as well. So. Um, those are some of the things that, that we are doing and, and, and certainly keeping at the forefront the race equity issues as they intersect the court system. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Spata, I want to follow up on, uh, on that, those remarks. Is how does your office, how many attorneys do you have? I guess that would be the first question. How many, how many attorneys um, are in, are in ACS? on the court legal services? I think you're muted. Sorry. There you go. Great, yeah, sorry. Uh, we have 330 uh, lawyers um, that are citywide. Um, so as, as you know, we're, we're a mayoral agency, so we have staff yeah. in, in all five counties. Um, how, how do you monitor your attorney's performance in this regard? How are you measuring, are there performance indicators that you're looking at in terms of how well they're incorporating um, these trainings into their practice? And um, well, let me, let me say, as far as um, attorney staff, let me just say we have about 230 to 250 currently um, attorney staff um, actuals, I believe. Um, we're certainly monitoring uh, who has taken the training and um, uh, who has not. So, so we get reports on, on who still has to complete the training. Um, and then, you know, we have uh, a lot of very close supervision um, by the manager, managerial staff. We have, um, uh, you know, a team, you know, organizationally we're set up as, as part of teams in each borough office. So we have, you know, many levels of supervision 
And um, we really tried to infuse through the supervision model, um, keeping at the forefront ideas of, of race equity, um, making sure that we are always looking at reunification as quickly as possible, visitation, um, trying to move uh, the cases as much as possible and, and as uh, requiring the least amount of court intervention. Um, I, I think that we also uh, have in our training program, we have about a four to five week uh, full-time training program um, and we will infuse some race equity conversations at the onset uh, at our initial training and we bring in um, Rise Magazine, for example, uh, to, to provide a parent perspective of going through the family court and really trying to infuse as much empathy um, as possible uh, with our attorney staff and, and, and really trying to um, find ways to make sure that the attorneys are, are looking at each case as a family and um, you know not, not just a case. So we try to find training opportunities and, and real uh, life opportunities to try to do that. So it's, it's, and so it's mostly through like a super a close supervision model. I, I, one analogy, and this might not be a, um, you know, fair or appropriate, but I've often heard, you know, a, a, an example of a, a, a new progressive district attorney gets elected, you know, and has says, I'm going to do all these progressive policies, but there are hundreds of ADAs underneath an elected DA who, you know, may have different, you know, might not be um, totally on board with all of those policies. And since those are the, 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 the lawyers in the courtroom, um, you know, sometimes the policies are not trickling down. And so I just, I think I just, I, that's one thing that, that um, I just want to kind of, because it's a large staff, you have, you know, a hundred, couple hundred lawyers um, thinking through just how, how well their practice is reflecting, is reflecting the, the, the priorities of um, the policymakers in the, in the agency. Again, yeah, sorry, you're muted. Well, yeah. I mean, while it sounds like it's, it's really, um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't feel so large because we're broken down by boroughs and, um, mm -hmm. approach. And so, um, while sure, big picture, it seems like that's a lot of staff. We really have it broken down by teams. And I also go to talk to every training class uh, new on incoming attorneys um, and talk about some of these issues around empathy and um, you know, the intersection of our work and parents, the responsibility we have as a government agency, the power that we have and the responsibility that we have and how it's, it's so important to um, it, you know, keep in mind that families going through the family court are having um, you know, challenges and um, again, to really try to infuse empathy into the work that we do. Um, and, you know, we also receive feedback from other attorneys, uh, institutional providers and advocates, and we meet with them on a regular basis. And we are, you know, open to receiving feedback about the work that we do and examples uh, of individual cases to try to dig deeper and um, see where, you know, we can make changes you know, if, if, if we need to. Um, and then I just have two more questions, then I'll turn over to Council Member Adams. I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Gibson and Traeger and Gibson and Traeger. Um, and uh, I also, um, okay, so <clears throat> next question I wanted to ask was kind of um, turning back to uh, the role of preventive services. Um, uh, and Commissioner Hansel or Deputy Commissioner Martin, maybe you can answer this of, um, how, how are we um, uh, looking at our, from a qualitative uh, standpoint, the effectiveness of um, different preventive models in uh, diverting families into a, you know, a greater intervention track of court order supervision or foster care? What's our kind of, are, are we looking at different models from a kind of in a, in a qualitative way in that, in that regard? Um, let me start and then I'll uh, ask Dr. Martin to speak about this uh, in, in much more detail than I can. But um, I think you know, we look at it both quantitatively and qualitatively. We, you know, we, we certainly, um, you know, we, when we redesigned our system um, in preparation for first the RFP, 
uh, that we issued and then the, um, the new contracts that went into place in July. Um, that was not a uh, that was not a, a simple process. Um, we spent quite a bit of time doing stakeholder engagement. Um, we talked to providers, we talked to parents, we talked to families, we talked to really basically all all uh, all aspects of the child welfare community, any stakeholder that uh, had any involvement with our prevention program. Uh, we did focus groups. Um, so. We did a great deal in addition to um, looking at our data, which we always do. Um, we also did a, a very, very large amount of stakeholder engagement um, that fed quite directly into our redesign of uh, the prevention services system. Um, we, we changed the, some of the service models. Um, we actually eliminated a couple of the models that we didn't think were working as effectively as others. We've expanded some models. We've created a new model, um, and Dr. Martin can talk about those. Um, so um, I think we, we certainly did it as part of the process leading up to the redesign of the system we put in place earlier this year. And um, we will continue to do it, I think, through our our interactions with certainly with providers uh, with whom Dr. Martin and I, for that matter, meet with on a regular basis uh, through the, our parent advisory council, um, really through all the interactions that we have with the families who are affected by the services to hear their perspective on what's working, what isn't working, what could work better. Um, and the, uh, the parent survey that we did for the first time last year, and again, thank you to the council and you, Chair Levin, for uh, asking us to do that. That's something that we intend to continue doing because we want to continue to have real time um, reactions from parents about how well the prevention services system is working for them. Um, but Dr. Martin, why don't you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, that is a really great question. And um, as the commissioner said, a lot of what we did before uh, implementing our new contracts is really driven by uh, research and evidence around positive outcomes for uh, for families that we work with. And I think it's important, you know, for us to invest in what works for families. Uh, so hearing from families in terms of their satisfaction with uh, prevention services was really important to us. You know, at the same time, you know, we understand that every family's needs are different and our system reflects a range of service models that allows families to choose and us to refer families to the programs that will best help them achieve their goals. Uh, so the one thing that I think we have achieved pretty uh, significantly was ensuring that families, no matter what borough they live in, have access to the models that are in our continuum. So, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, while some families in our continuum can achieve their goals through a case management model, other families face issues such as past trauma and behavioral issues, domestic violence, mental health challenges, and so on that require therapeutic services. And so we also heard that. Um, I think you recall that at uh, previous to July 1, uh, you know, if I was a family living in Queens who had, uh, you know, a child under the age of five, uh, but we had faced some significant trauma, unfortunately, the way that our system was uh, constructed, that family, because of where they live, would not have had access to that trauma-informed model. And so we really try to, uh, you know, construct a system where families can have their needs met and we can match them with the services that best meet their needs. And how are they doing that now during the pandemic? Um, well, a lot of this work used to be done in person. Mm -hmm. How's it being done? Um, probably uh, very carefully. <laughs> um, and so uh, our prevention agencies are still uh, serving families. Um, much of the work is being done virtually, uh, but for families where we must have an in-person visit uh, or uh, to collaborate with, for example, the Division of Child Protection, where we must do uh, transition meetings and, and joint home visits, you know, we first start by ensuring uh, 
uh, the safety, that it is safe for that family, that it is safe for the staff. And once we have determined that, then those visits will continue, those in-person uh, home visits will continue just as they did uh, pre-COVID. Uh, uh, so for the most part, I would say that the agencies and the Division of Child Protection are still uh, collaborating and making those decisions uh, with families uh, in, in community. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Commissioner Hans, I, I want to ask one more question and then I'll turn it over to uh, Councilmember Adams. <clears throat> um, I was reading um, uh, some uh, literature by uh, Dr. Jessica Price um, from uh, uh, Florida State University. Um, and she has written about uh, uh, a practice of blind removal meetings that they are uh, engaging with Nassau County on. This is through OCFS, uh, has given a grant to Nassau County um, to work on uh, blind removal meetings, which is uh, um, you know, a, a, a process um, that um, employs a, a, a panel, um, uh, so a, a committee to make decisions around, um, um, you know, these different steps along in the in the investigative process. And um, uh, when a CPS is presenting um, the uh, facts of the case, they do it in a way that does not make any reference um, to race or socioeconomic status, I think. Um, read from her page in a minute here. But um, uh, what is um, have have you have we been looking at that here in New York City? Have we looked at what's happened in um, Nassau County? And is there yeah is there any plan to to incorporate this process? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, Nassau County initiated uh, their blind removal process quite a number of years ago, I think as far back as possibly as 2011, but it's certainly quite a number of years ago. Um, uh, they uh, have had, so they've had a number of years of experience with it. Um, they, I, I don't believe it actually uh, has produced any um, uh, quantitative data on the impact it's had on racial disproportionality, but, but certainly the Nassau County folks feel like it's been positive in terms of their ability to address uh, racial disparity issues. Um, and um, uh, as a result of that, actually, this is a very timely question. Um, uh, OCFS just, uh, just about two weeks ago um, uh, has issued a directive to us and to all of the counties across New York State to uh, implement um, uh, blind removal procedures of some kind. Um, so we actually, uh, we, we of course have been talking with Nassau County for some time. We're obviously neighboring counties. We work with them very closely. So we've been following uh, on a kind of direct, uh, you know, program to program and agency to agency basis, the work that they've been doing for a number of years. Uh, but now we actually are, are going to be very focused on looking at uh, what the state has uh, asked us to implement and actually developing a plan to do that. So we will be working on a plan uh, to um, to develop a, uh, a components of a blind renewal process based upon the directive that actually has just come down from the state. So we're just really beginning the process of figuring out how to do that. We also, uh, I understand we have actually met with Dr. Price. And so we do have some familiarity with her as well. So this is, yes, this is an area we're very familiar with. Uh, and I think, you know, has potential to be a, a contributor to the efforts that we're making. Great. That's good to hear. Um, okay, I'll turn it over to um, Councilmember Adams, and we won't have a clock for Councilmember questions because we don't, I think, have too many uh, council members to ask questions. So, uh, Councilmember Adams. Time starts now. Councilmember Adams, are you there? It's 
It appears that Councilmember Adams is having technical difficulties this time. Chair Levin, if you'd like to continue any questions. Sure, we've also been joined by Council Member Barron. Um, do any other colleagues have questions that they would like to ask at the moment? Um, please use the raise hand function. Bear with me, my computer has frozen as well. But I have to get back. And I hear my one-year-old is up from his nap, so he might make a you know, cameo here. Councilmember Adams is, appears to be having some technical difficulties. Yes. She does I'm have- I'm sorry. Uh, oh, oh I'll, I'll just continue to ask some questions here. Um, uh, until until uh, Councilmember Adams is ready. Um, Mr. Hansel, the Deputy Commissioner for Child and Family Wellbeing position has been vacant since the beginning of the year. Um, how has this impacted ACS's equity work and, and what's the plan to fill that position? Yeah, it actually has not been entirely vacant. We've had an interim Deputy Commissioner, uh, Karen okay. Resnick, who's been in that role. Um, so we are, we are continuing recruitment for a, a permanent new Deputy Commissioner, but we have had somebody um, filling the responsibilities of that position. Um, I don't think it's had any impact on our equity strategies work. Um, our uh, equity strategies team um, uh, under the leadership of uh, Barbara Turk uh, and with uh, Tyler James, who is uh, one of the witnesses today, who is our director of race equity strategies has been continuing their work um, with regard to implementation of the equity action plan and actually a lot of other activities within the agency. So, um, uh, you know, our, our process of recruitment for, for a permanent deputy commissioner, I don't think has had any impact on our, uh, on our equity strategies work at all. Um, uh, director James, do you want to speak a little bit about the work that you've been doing at, uh, as director of race equity, uh, race equity strategies? Please. And, uh, thank you for that question. Um, so as a uh, commissioner outlined in our testimony, we have been very active in making sure that uh, we continue to implement the interventions that were outlined in our equity action plan. Uh, so part of that work required uh, this making sure that our staff continue to ongo training around implicit bias and structural racism, uh, and making sure that we continue to have conversations to how um, implicit bias impacts decision making um, when it comes to practice. Uh, I think something else that we were really just focused on as we continue to manage the equity action plan, um, looking at the work that we've done around our CARES program and seeing that there is the expansion of that into other uh, boroughs and as we'd like to take that citywide. Um, and it's also providing support to the different units around the work that they're doing here. And as the commissioner also mentioned in their testimony, looking to see how we can partner with National Innovation Service uh, to, to make sure that we're doing the work that help us transform our system. Uh, so we've been able to be very active uh, when it comes to uh, this continuing the work that's been set forth by the Racial Equity and Cultural Competence Committee and making sure that this is not just efforts of one division, but it's an agency-wide approach. Um, can you can you speak a little bit about what um, a training uh, session would look like with um, with frontline staff, whether it's CPS or attorneys or um, uh, you know, kind of what what is what is their what is their <clears throat> excuse me what is their feedback? You know, during the process, and what is what is the um, what does the session consist of? What does it look like? Right. So there, there's been times where now that we're doing this virtually, it's something you still wanted to make sure we kept as a component of the course is that staff have the ability to interact with each other and walk through this process together, where they're able to look at case studies that examine how implicit bias impacts practice. Uh, where they're able to implement strategies where they're looking at um, how they can implement some debiasing strategies in the work. Uh, so it's essential that we create this safe space for people to have the conversations and learn together um, to see what they can do to combat uh, implicit bias. And I think it's, it's essential for us to make sure everyone ha has that foundation understanding how implicit bias works. 
Right. Um, Because one thing just in my, you know, one meeting that I had with with CPS frontline staff, um, you know, 18 months ago or so, um, you know, this was an issue that was very front and center um, in their mind. Um, I could I could tell it was it was very much, um, you know, a real, you know, in addition to kind of resources and things like making sure that they had tablets and just kind of things to make the job um, uh, you know, more effective. It was, you know, this was something that was kind of front front of mind. And so um, uh, getting that getting that um, uh, kind of overall um, uh, investment in in this effort, I think, is um, I think something that that uh, probably be well received by the frontline staff. So, um, so uh, I'll move over to um, um, Some issues around um, um, foster care. Um, we saw the kinship navigation pilots um, um, that uh, ended in June um, uh, due to funding restrictions, um, and that was, you know, unfortunate. And we did whatever we did what we did the best we could um, at the at the council. But what um, uh, what best practices were gleaned from the pilots? And what lessons could be embedded system wide? I guess that might be Commissioner Hansel or Deputy Commissioner Farber. Yeah, definitely, uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber. I'll say, uh, yeah, we we too were sorry not to have the funding to continue that, but I think we did learn a lot from it. And um, the good news is uh, that our work around kinship has been, I think, very very successful. And even though that particular initiative we didn't have continuing funding for, there's a tremendous amount of work that we're continuing to do. And I will let Deputy Commissioner Farber speak to it. Um, thank you, Commissioner, um, and thank you, Chair Levin, for that question. Um, and uh, I think the Commissioner covered some of this um, in his testimony, um, but we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, the implementation of a real focus on placing children with kin. Um, it is absolutely a strategy around reducing trauma, and it is a very important um, race equity strategy in terms of maintaining children um, with people that they know and love and are familiar with and still connected with their communities and so forth. Um, and so as the commissioner mentioned, over the last two and a half, three years, um, we have very significantly increased the proportion of children placed with kin um, with support from the foster care task force. And as the commissioner said, via other um, you know, strategies and, and resources and investments. Um, and so we have increased that proportion from 31% of children in foster care. Now we're almost to 42% of children in foster care. Um, and we are very pleased to report that those um, results um, are not disproportionate. Um, African-American children are um, placed with kinship care uh, just around the same 41, 42% um, figure. Um, and so this is a really um, important initiative for us and something that we're going um, to uh, continue to focus on. Um, what have, have we been able to, because the, the equity plan indicates that monthly kinship data reports um, will be generated from February 2019 onward. Um, how has COVID impacted um, the monthly totals with this? And, and, and um, I guess, it, how has COVID affected um, the strategy around kinship placement? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, and I think you know that we come at kinship from a couple of different directions. So first of all, um, the Division of Child Protection Staff under my colleague, Deputy Commissioner William Fletcher, they work um, to place children in with kin right at the moment of removal um, as often as possible. And then the foster care agencies also work to move children from uh, non-kinship 
relationship homes to kinship homes um, when that is possible. Um, and we're very pleased to report that uh, COVID has not had a, a negative impact. In fact, in, even in these last uh, seven months, the proportion of children placed with kin has continued to, to inch up. Um, so uh, we're pleased about that. Um, and then one other question, um, the equity plan says that uh, by fall of 2019, um, ACS would, would conduct an analysis of quote unquote aggregate reasons why black and African American children are placed into foster care at disproportionately high rates. Uh, what did the analysis say? And can you share that analysis with the council? Yeah, I'll say, I'll say a few words, then I'll uh, see if uh, Director James or um, uh, Deputy Commissioner White want us to speak more to it. But essentially, uh, you know, the analysis that I laid out in the testimony uh, is kind of the framework of the analysis, which, which shows us that um, as um, families, children, families progress through the child welfare system, the disproportion that starts at the front door increases step by step. And that leads ultimately to the disproportion uh, of in, that we see in children entering foster care. So, so a significant piece of the analysis was looking at the stages of the process that ultimately lead to a child being placed in foster care and trying to understand how racial disproportionality gets introduced at each of those stages and then what we can do to offset that disparity. Um, and then specifically, uh, as I talked about a bit, you know, as we, our real focus, which is our, not our real focus, but one of our primary areas of focus, which is um, uh, reducing uh, legal intervention of any kind, whether it's foster care placement or remand or supervision um, through prevention services and through more upfront engagement of families with services um, is what we think based on, on the work that we've done has the thing that has the most potential to reduce all foster care placement, but also to reduce racial disproportionality in foster care placement. But let me let me turn it to either uh, uh, Director James or, or Deputy Commissioner White to uh, elaborate on that. Okay. Whoever wants to take it. I guess my, my question is: is there an anal is there a is there an analysis that's like a a, a written uh, analysis, or is it is it more of a kind of broader? broader thing that was incorporated into the test. Hi, uh, Councilman Levin, thanks for the question. Um, hey, Deputy Commissioner. So yeah, the, the, this is ongoing analysis. We're constantly doing it. We're trying to um, work out the best ways also to measure some of the things we've been talking about today. And I think um, what the commissioner referred to in his comments just now is really critical to understand the sort of the, the front door through each step of, of a family's experience with ACS. And so when we looked at 2019 data, a black child in an indicated child protective investigation was 1.6 times more likely to be placed in foster care than a white or Hispanic child in an indicated child protective investigation. So, you know, trying to understand why that is, is a more difficult thing than just looking at the measure, right? But we have, data that allow us to understand this disparity and then we can dig in to try to understand what's underneath it but it's something we have to constantly do um so we've been uh i think uh council member adams is is uh is ready for her question so i'll i'll turn it over to her at this point time starts now uh, Adrian, I, I don't know if you heard me before, but you, since there's not a lot of uh, council members to ask questions, you can ask as many as you, as many as you like. No time limit. Uh, Chair, it sounds like we're having the same technical difficulties with council member Adams and her audio at this time. Adrian, are you there? Or maybe if you want to call in to ask your questions through the phone line. Do any other um, 
Council members have questions to ask? Council member Grudentrick or Barron? Um, so while we're while we're um, seeing if we can get Councilmember Adams back on, um, uh, 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 Deputy Commissioner White, I was curious, um, uh, what are because you're you're doing a lot of the the data analytics um, in in your, in your um, you know under under you, um, what are what are indicators that you're seeing that are that are concerning in this, you know, around uh, through the equity um, lens, and what are what are indicators that you're seeing that are moving in the right direction? I think the the by far the the most concerning is the disproportionality at the front end of the system because that affects every step of the system that follows. And that's not to take um, any responsibility away from us because there are also disparities at every step of the system that we need to address. But that front end, um, you know, a, a, a um, black child is about six times as likely as a white child to be in a report of abuse or neglect last year and thus an investigation. And that just shapes everything that follows. So the mandated reporter work is really fundamental. We need to figure out how to get supports to families sooner. We need to make sure that schools and other folks who are making calls to the SCR understand how to get support and services to families sooner than a crisis. Um, you know, the kind of crisis that arises that leads to the most intrusive interventions we have is often something that could have been prevented if it was addressed sooner. And that's, you know, when we look at, um, you know, on the positive side, I think the, um, the movement towards um, prevention is really very clearly associated, correlated with the really dramatic reduction in the number of children entering foster care. You know, you go back 10 years and about 70% more children per year entered foster care than today. So the work we've done in prevention is a really powerful thing. And, um, and it's also, it's community-based and it really um, is able to provide the kind of supports people need close to home. And that's what will keep our system headed in the right direction. Um, uh, two, two causes for I guess uh, kind of in a broader question, um, are we examining different reasons for calls to the SCR and identifying which ones are, um, you know, most um, inappropriately numerous, you know, are, um, uh, or that, that are, that are, um, that are further, that are, that are are disproportionately exacerbating the disproportionality of uh, of that front door uh, uh, in terms of impacts on on, on black families. So, uh, in particular, educational neglect and uh, and drug uh, usage. Because I, I, one uh, piece of data I saw said, um, you know, a, a, a black family is uh, ten times as likely uh, to be called. Uh, uh, have an SDR call uh, regarding drug usage when we know that um, drug usage is is relatively the same across um, racial ethnic lines. Um, white families use drugs just as much as black families use drugs, and vice versa. So, um, I mean, I, I I will say that uh, certainly educational neglect, which is which is in fact, <clears throat> you know. The majority of calls that come from schools are not about educational neglect; they're about other things. But the cases, but but you know, nearly half are do relate to educational neglect, and those cases are sometimes absolutely legitimate phone calls, very serious concerns about what's going on in a family, um, 
In other cases, when we get them, we find that we can track them into alternative response, into the CARES program. Again, as the commissioner described in the testimony, we're, we're dramatically expanding that program. Um, so while ed neglect is a serious issue, it can be handled in different ways. And again, that when schools, um, when schools have the opportunity to find services in their community for that family, it's it, and a child is not at uh, can they're not concerned that a child is at immediate risk of harm. They can make that referral themselves and not come through the SCR. So that's critical. And the drug uh, the drug use question. One of the interesting things we found in our data analysis is that children entering foster care, white children entering foster care about half of them are coming in to foster care because of uh, parent substance use. And that's very different from black and Latino children. Actually black and Latino children, it's about a quarter of entries to foster care are related to parent substance and alcohol use. So we need to dig underneath that and understand on the white side of the ledger, is that because of um, opiate use, things happening in that community? Or is it because we react differently to drug use? Um, or are we reacting differently to other allegations for black and Latino families than we are for white families? Um. Uh, just one other question just about that data. Is there, um, because this is, I think that an analysis of the front, of that front door, of the S SDR uh, um, a complaint, um, because that is so instructive, as, as we've all been saying today, that everything follows from um, that initial call. Um, do we have... A, is there somebody at, at, at OCFS that, or is there a team or an office at OCFS that is, um, that is entirely dedicated to analysis of SCR calls and kind of what, what we're able to interpret from those analysis? Is that, is that I mean, I, I know that that's kind of what you do at ACS, is there somebody at, or is there, is there a deputy commissioner at OCFS that, that's doing that? Well, I'll answer part of it. I'll answer it more on a policy level than a data level, then maybe uh, Deputy Commissioner White can answer on the data level. But yes, there is a deputy commissioner who has responsibility, who oversees the SCR. Um, uh, deputy Commissioner Garti Ogundimo. She is, uh, I will say, very engaged and focused on these issues and spends a great deal of time <laughs> talking with us about them. Um, so I, I would say, you know, I think OCFS is, is very much focused on them. Um, you know, OCFS, of course, has statewide responsibility and these issues don't look the same across all of the state of New York. Um, so, uh, you know, part of what we do, and frankly, I, I would say part of our responsibility is to make, because, you know, we're one of, of 58 local social ser services districts in the state. We're one of 58 child welfare agencies, but of course we reflect about two thirds of the state of New York. Uh, in terms of population, um, you know, we wanna make sure that OCFS uh, truly understands how these issues manifest themselves in New York City, which, which may in some cases be different from how they look elsewhere in the state. And, um, uh, and so that's why we, we do have regular uh, data conversations with them, which, which uh, Deputy Commissioner White can speak to more than I can. But, but I would say that uh, this is an issue, especially more recently, that both Commissioner Poole and Deputy Commissioner Garti Ogundimu have been um, very, very engaged in and really has spent a lot of time with us looking at. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. They do, they have a very good data shop. We work with them pretty regularly on all kinds of things. And uh, they certainly have looked at disproportionality at the SCR. In fact, they, they've shared some of that data with us. Um, one thing just to, uh, going back to education and neglect, um, and I don't, I mean, I, I understand that everyone's looking at this um, and I'm glad that they're doing that now. Um, I will say that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a hearing um, with the education committee and I asked 
Chancellor Carranza about children in shelters whose um, uh, whose whose Wi-Fi capabilities or broadband capabilities were not you know they were just not working their T-Mobile devices weren't working or they didn't have they don't have Wi-Fi at all and the mayor's now said that he's going to um, uh, hook up Wi-Fi to every shelter. I am a little bit dubious that he's going to be able to do that in as quick, as quick a time frame as he thinks he's going to be able to do that because it's a big job for hundreds of shelters, a couple hundred shelters. Um, and frankly, Chancellor Carranza said, yeah, we're, we're, we're making sure that uh, children in 10 shelters have are able to get swapped out uh, T-Mobile SIM cards with Verizon SIM cards that have better you know, better uh, uh, broadband um, coverage. Um, I just, I, I'm just, uh, I just want to make sure that, that that families are not catching an ACS case because uh, DOE's T-Mobile coverage stinks, you know, um, or, or they're not getting the device that they need or they're in shelter and can't get out of shelter and don't have access to Wi-Fi or any of these reasons, um, you know, this is, you know, that would be absolutely unconscionable um, if that was the case. And so, I mean, how, how are we keeping track of that? Well, let me say, we feel very much the same way. Um, and that's why, um, you know, really from the very beginning of the pandemic, when the schools closed in March, this was a concern uh, that we were, were very, very um, worried about. And so we worked closely with, uh, with DOE on the initial guidance, which came out in April, which I will say, you know, we, um, we, uh, I'm in regular contact and many of my colleagues uh, who are testifying are in regular contact with our colleagues around the country. Um, and I think we were one of, if not the first jurisdiction in the country um, to address the issue of the impact of uh, technology barriers on the, the inappropriate impact of technology barriers on on SCR reporting. But um, we were very closely with DOE back in April uh, on guidance they issued um, to say that uh, technology barriers in and of themselves were not a reason to call an SCR report, that they were an issue for the for uh, the, you know, the schools to, to work with parents and families and kids on. Um, and then uh, when, when uh, schools open in the fall with hybrid learning, uh, as you know, and I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we work with them on our reissuance of that report. Um, so I, I will say, I think from, uh, from a policy perspective, we have been working very closely with DOE on this from the beginning. Um, and we've been focused on it from the beginning. And as I also mentioned in the testimony, um, we're pleased that the state has now finally just, just uh, as of last week, um, implemented some some very similar uh, procedures at the SCR that now will apply not just in New York City, uh, but statewide. Um, so I, you know, I, I'll defer to my colleagues at DOE and, and the chancellor to talk about how they're addressing technology issues. But I will say there was a lot of discussion about this issue um, at the mayor's press briefing on Monday, uh, at, where the chancellor mm -hmm. was present. That's where the mayor said that they would be making sure that all shelters have Wi-Fi. Um, and I will also say that, that the chancellor um, I think at that briefing was very clear that uh, that he and the leadership at DOE understand uh, that um, issues that relate to technology, either uh, actually having technology or being able to access it through internet connection, connectivity, um, were issues for the DOE to resolve, not issues for the child welfare system to resolve, that he is very familiar with the guidance that was uh, issued, um, and that he would reinforce that guidance to all uh, all DOE staff. So uh, I, I will say, at least from a leadership level, I think DOE has been very much in sync with us on this, and um, and has been, you know, very supportive of our efforts to make sure that this doesn't lead to unnecessary reporting into the SCR mm -hmm. and unnecessary involvement in the child welfare system when we shouldn't be involved at all. I, I will also so mention that we, you know, it of, of course is the case that in many of the situations, um, as our CPS go out and do investigations. They have found, situ you know, as they talk with families and talk with kids, situations where uh, children are having difficulty connecting, and actually, uh, CPS have been able to help with that in a lot of situations. And obviously, if we're in a home working with a family and we can help resolve a problem, we will do that. Um, but we don't fundamentally think that should be uh, a mm -hmm. response that's assigned to the child welfare system. Yeah. 
Um, and we're and we're tracking, we're keeping a close eye on SDR calls and and uh, education neglect calls, and and making sure that if they are related to, you know, that we're taking note when they when they're related to, you know, truancy on remote. We we re we follow the data on on you know both both types yeah. you know of calls, the allegations that are made, and who's reporting them very, very closely. And that's sort of the basis for our conversations with the Got state it. about the SCR. Yeah. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, Councilmember Adams is having um, some connectivity problems uh, herself. And so she's she asked me to ask her question on her behalf, which is um, uh, if we could ask uh, the percentages of, of white versus black children with regards to remote versus in-person learning and the same question with regard to device versus Wi-Fi access. So I think um, how many uh, which children have when device Wi-Fi meaning um, I think broadband versus Wi-Fi. I think that those are questions that would have to be directed to the Department of Education. Unless uh, uh, Andrew, do we have any data? I don't. I don't believe we do. Those those would be uh, questions I think to address to DOE. Okay. Um, I can, I can, uh, I'll, I'll take that back to her and, and we'll, we'll reach out to DOE on that question. Um, and then, okay, so I, I think I, I am, um, uh, this would be my last uh, question. Um, uh, and it's kind of a broad question, but what, you know, this, the pandemic has been, um, has given um, ACS, uh a, an insight into what happens when the number of SCR calls drops dramatically and um and so there's less intervention um what are we able to extrapolate from that are we seeing are we, i mean I, i'm i don't think we've seen an increase in you know, severe cases of child abuse. Um, I'm not sure that we're seeing an increase in uh, negative impacts to children that are, you know, not just a, 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 um, a result of, you know, this kind of isolation that we're experiencing, that we're all experiencing. But I mean, are we seeing an increase in, in what we think of? I mean, in other words, are we, does this mean that we were, that we've been over investigating families all along because what we've seen now as we, the numbers have dropped is that we haven't haven't seen you know a higher level of crises or catastrophe yeah that's um it's a very important question and it's one that we spent a lot of time thinking about um I will say, you know, when when the pandemic began uh, in in mid March, well, it began earlier than that, but when it you know really resulted in the closure of the schools and and the you know shutdown of a lot of um, activities in the city in mid March, um, we did see a dramatic decline in reports. Um, that is not terribly surprising, uh, given who the reports normally come from. About a quarter of our reports normally come from the schools, and schools were, uh, were, were closed for in-person learning. Of course, they were doing remote. We've been talking about that uh, here for some time. Um, and a lot of the other service providers that would uh, routinely see children were not seeing them during that period. Um, that's changed over time, and actually, um, uh, you know, we're now at a point where uh, our reporting levels are not quite back to what they would normally be or what they were a year ago, but they're much, much, much closer than they were uh, in the early, um, uh, early days or early months of the pandemic. So, um, and, you know, we, we even, even in, in normal years, which this certainly has not been, but even in normal years, um, we see fluctuations in the levels of SCR reporting over the course of the year. Uh, they tend to drop during the summer months when the schools are out of session. They tend to drop during holidays. They tend to uh, increase during other periods of the year. So it's not unusual to see some fluctuation in SCR reports, but obviously uh, the pattern we saw this year was was quite aberrational uh, because of, of uh, the response to COVID. Um, so we, we have been monitoring very closely to um, uh, you know, to make sure, I know there was a lot of concern, especially early on, that this might have meant that there were children who were isolated at home, who were in dangerous situations and were not coming to the attention of uh, either ACS or the child welfare system uh, or others because of, of reduced reporting. 
Um, to some extent, we don't know what we don't know. Um, but we, what we have done is we have looked very closely over time and tracked very closely over time um, the composition of the reports we were getting because we thought, you know, if, if we began to see of a reduced number of reports, um, a real tilt towards more serious reports of, of, you know, more serious physical abuse, that might suggest that, um, in fact, there, there were concerns. We haven't seen that um, so much in New York. Um, in fact, what we have seen, we've seen, interestingly, um, a, um, a real change in the, in the um, proportions of report, reporters, so that whereas normally about two-thirds, slightly more than two-thirds of our reports come from mandated reporters, about 68%, I think, uh, in typical years. Uh, during the COVID period, that's dropped quite considerably. And the number of reports, proportion of reports, I should say, that we get from non-mandated reporters who are usually family members, neighbors, uh, you know, community members, has increased, um, which suggests that people are being vigilant or are taking responsibility for making sure that children in their communities are safe, which we think is, is a good thing. Um, so, you know, we have been tracking that very closely. And so we know, you know, we, we, can, we can look at and we can analyze the data about the reports we're receiving. We, we of course, can't, uh, you know, analyze because we don't have data on the reports that we're not receiving. Um, what I would say is that what, you know, we have learned some things, I think, from the COVID period um, about um, better ways that we can keep kids safe and ways in which, frankly, we can reduce, um, involvement with the court system and, and, and in foster care that we do want to continue um, even after the pandemic ends and we have the opportunity to return to more normal operations. Um, I think you know, we've learned a lot more about the value of prevention services and especially um, primary prevention services. Um, and uh, if you'd like, if we have a minute, I, I would love to have Assistant Commissioner um, Dale Joseph talk a, about yeah. the, the ways in which the the work of the FECs, for example, has really shifted during COVID. So to really kind of front load our engagement with families who um, fortunately we were not seeing as much through child welfare reports, but we were very much engaged with through the, the primary prevention system. Um, similarly, we have been doing, as I mentioned in the testimony, a lot more work with our foster care agencies and with the attorneys who represent parents and children outside of the court system to try to expedite reunification of children with families and, and their, uh, their movement out of the foster care system. So I, th I would say really that um, I think what we, if anything, what we've learned from this period is that um, some of the directions in which we have been moving in New York City and at ACS, which is really towards um, more upstream service-oriented service involvement with families, um, has proven to uh, to be the right approach during this period, and I think will continue to be. Um, and that we've learned in some ways that um, that there are things that we can continue to do more um, more aggressively outside of the the formal child welfare investigative process and outside the formal court process um, that will. Um, you know, contribute contribute to the well-being of families, and and that we ought to continue to try to move our system and move the investments we're making in that direction. Um, but if it's if it's okay, Chairman, could, could we let yes, uh, uh, Assistant Minister yes. uh, Del Joseph speak a little about the role of the FECs and the and the partnership programs during this period? Absolutely, yes. And how they've been operating, uh, Assistant Commissioner? How how have you been able to do your work with with uh, during the pandemic? Great. Socially distant. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair Levin. And, um, you know, just to build on the commissioner's testimony about the role of the family enrichment centers and the community partnerships, they have been phenomenal. They have been um, uh, flexible. They have worked with the community to address a number of needs. Um, during COVID, of course, there was a lot that had to be curtailed in terms of their hours of operation uh, in order to maintain safety standards. Um, they have gone remote mostly. Um, the partnerships uh, have been connecting with providers. Part of the role of the community partnerships is to make sure that providers are connected to each other so that they can in turn connect them to primary prevention resources and others in the community. They have continued to do that. Um, we have been extremely impressed by their ability to be flexible, to continue to work with each other, make referrals to each other, to invite providers to their virtual meetings to talk about things happening in the community, whether it's um, you know, HRA coming to their meetings or Department of Homeless Services. They have been 
um, extremely instrumental in making sure that providers stay connected to each other. And as a result, we know that community members then stay connected to each other. Family enrichment centers, as you may well know, are place-based um, sites within communities. They too have had to curtail their hours of operation, um, but they have done tremendous work around food distribution, um, providing PPEs to families. Um, they have continued throughout the summer doing summer virtual camps. Um, you know, families who have been in shelter, who were quarantined, one of our community partners and FECs um, partnered together to um, actually provide hot meals to families who were um, quarantined during COVID. Um, so they have done um, a tremendous job in making sure that we remain connected to, to families and communities um, in ways that's quite seamless. Um, you know, they really have not dropped the ball in any way, shape or form during this crisis as they have been obviously focused on their health and the health of their families. Um, they have remained vigilant around making sure that families get the resources they need, um, maintaining office hours where they can, helping individuals with a range of resources around unemployment benefits, um, connecting to um, getting um, air conditioners, whatever was needed in the community, the partnerships and the FEC stepped up. And so we never had a doubt that they were um, kind of the eyes and ears um, within our system on the ground uh, really helping families where the need was was the greatest. And that's an ongoing endeavor. You know that that work is ongoing for sure. It is absolutely. And it's one of the things I was just going to say is that it's it's also you know it, it, um, even even beyond you know I there was I saw a an article this this um, this weekend in the New York Times that said that. You know, the economic impact of COVID is going to hit is going to stay with New York City much longer, um, you know, on into you know for, for another three, four, five years. Um, and so, those resources, the food resources, the uh, 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 benefits and um, job training, and job, you know, and it, all that, all of those things that um, the family enrichment centers. Um, can be very helpful with us as hubs in these communities. Um, that work is going to be ongoing and, you know, even more important than it was before. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And if I may, um, you know, I, I think the corollary to what uh, Assistant Commissioner Joseph described in, in terms of the work of the FECs and the CPPs and the primary prevention, the corollary to that is what I talked about in my testimony, which is our expansion of uh, the care system, because um, while you know we don't we don't control who calls the SCR, although we think we can impact it, and we're trying very hard, but we don't control it. We don't control what the state accepts. We don't control what the state refers to us, but we can control what we do with the reports that we get. And we think that one of our, our most powerful tools for doing that is the expansion of the uh, what we're now calling the CARES program, because. It, you know, when families do come through that door, whether we think they should or shouldn't, when they come to us through that door, we still have the opportunity to focus with them on a response that is framed around what they need, the services they need, the concrete supports that they need. And so that's why I think that's important. And, and I'd like to, if I, if I could just give uh, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher an opportunity to say a word about what DCP has learned during the COVID period that's really informing our expansion yeah. of the CARES program. Right. So thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, yes. And thank you, um, Chair Levin, um, for bringing this to the forefront. So our CPS, our specialists, um, as you all probably know, have been doing a phenomenal job, right, in ensuring the safety of our families and of our children, sometimes at the expense of their own health. Right. So they've been out there. As the Commissioner noted, our FAR specialists have been out there meeting with families and learning what the families actually need as they navigate um, through this pandemic. And some of the things similar to um, what Dale des described that the FECs are, are, are working on and embarking on is making sure that the basic needs of families are being met. Many of our FAR specialists have taken food to families as they've been out, as they have been out there visiting families, they're noticing that families are in need of food. 
They've been taking, for example, pack and plays because we have families that are doubling and tripling up, right? So we want to ensure that children are sleeping safely. Um, we even have taken cell phones to families who are experiencing DV so that as we safety plan with them, right, they're able to reach out to others when they're in distress. Um, so there have been so many things. And what has helped, um, and the commissioner hasn't given himself credit, what has helped is our communication with community around coping with COVID and teens who have um, experienced quite a bit of challenges during COVID, getting that information out, and then our frontline staff, along with our FAR specialists, are discussing the communication, ensuring that families are able to access any resources or systems that they need in order to make it through this pandemic. So it's been very enlightening for us um, as we do our work on a day-to-day -day basis. And our staff are so appreciative that as an agency, we are wrapping our arms around families to ensure the safety of children. So thank you for giving me that, that opportunity um, to highlight the work of our frontline specialists. No, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And I, I, um, you know, I, 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 I think back to that, the, the meeting that we had in Williamsburg uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, no, what, what I remember most of that is, is you know, um, just how conscientious uh, the, the, the people in that room were of these issues. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they, were in, in, they were not in any way, um, you know, ignoring or blind to, the, to, to, these, to these really, really difficult and structural issues and wanted to be part of figuring out how to dismantle that. And so um, I, I, you know, I very much got the sense that, that they were, uh, will be active participants one other thing just to note is that when I left then to go home at whatever it was, 6 p.m., almost everybody was still in the office. And I remember talking to one CPS who was leaving to go work out and then was coming back, you know, mm -hmm. in the night to, to finish their work. So that was, um, you know, that's uh, true. Um, thank you. So thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, so I think that that's, that's all. I'll let you all um, go. And we have public testimony coming up. Um, I, I do want to thank um, Mr. Hansel. Uh, I think I greatly appreciate that. I think there are five deputy commissioners uh, at this hearing, um, one or two assistant commissioners, a director, um, an associate commissioner, um, and and that's a, that that's really appreciated. It and it, that's an indication to me that uh, ACS takes this issue, you know. Uh, with uh, with the utmost seriousness, and that it's it, this is um, this is a collective um, this is collective work that's going to take a long time. Um, it's not the work of one administration. It's not the work of one council. Um, but creating the structures in place, um, um, because this is about dismantling these things. These are these structural. Um, uh, and societal, you know, historical uh, racism doesn't doesn't get um, you know doesn't get erased overnight. It has to be dismantled, over, and and that is the that is the responsibility of an entire of of all of us. And it it has to be um, done in a way that's that is um, to be effective uh, must be comprehensive. And, um, and and that's really what I'm I'm seeing here by every um, you know uh, uh, so many divisions of ACS here as part of this meeting. So I want to thank you all so much for your testimony, um, and for your candor, and um, and knowing that we have a lot more work to do. Uh, this, this work is really never done. So um, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, we'll take a, a two minute break and uh, come in for public testimony.
while we are on break, I just want to set, set up a few reminders in advance of us starting our public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one. Panelists are going to have three minutes to testify. We ask that you limit your testimony to three minutes. And as always, you can submit longer testimony for the record. As far as who our next panelists are going to be, we are going to call up in the following order. Cheyenne Deo Prasad, Zakia Gardner, Joyce McMillan, and Jeanette Vega. And I will repeat this once we resume the hearing in a few moments.
All right, once again, thank you to the members of the administration for your testimony. We are now going to turn to public testimony. Again, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we are going to be calling on individuals one by one. Panelists are gonna have three minutes to testify. We ask that you limit your testimony to three minutes. And as always, you can submit longer written testimony for the record. Council members who have any questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after that panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will then give you the go ahead to, be to begin your testimony upon setting the timer. Please note that you should wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before you begin to deliver your testimony as there is a slight delay with the unmuting function. So the next four panelists are going to be in this order. Cheyenne Dio Prasad, Zakia Gardner, Joyce McMillan, and Jeanette Vega. And we are going to begin with Cheyenne Dio Prasad. Time starts now. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Cheyenne. I go to City College. I'm a freshman. And I just want to say, like, thank you for taking out your time to listen to us and being here. Um, I am a Fair Futures advocate and I've been in foster care for a little over three years now, I, like four, almost four. And um, as the commissioner said before, all of these things like he's saying and he's being questioned, questioned on, he, I think they work really, really hard. And us as foster youth and kids who are in foster care, like we've lived through this whole entire story. We're going through all of this and we reap the benefits really of what they're doing and what Julie Farber is doing, the commissioner is doing. And I have a coach and for the past four years, I've had a coach and her name is Zakia. And I think that I wouldn't be at the place where I am right now without my coach, because I, at the moment, I'm working really hard. I work two jobs. I go to school. I, um, I'm a full-time student and I like, on the side, I'm also a Fair Futures advocate. And I think that Without my coach, I wouldn't be able to do all of these things because she motivates me and she helps me go through the daily struggles of if I'm going to be able to do all these things, if I'm going to be happy throughout the day, what I'm going through. She speaks to me all the time. And I just think that coaches are super, super important because being a foster kid, we being foster kids, we don't have like parents that everybody else has and we don't have that support that everybody else has. And it sucks because as a student, as a kid, as just somebody, as just somebody, you deserve like support. But as foster kids, we don't have that support. And we rely like, well, at least me, I rely heavily on my coach. And from going, from coming into foster care, I relied on her and she was like my rock. And I didn't have anybody else to rely on. And I just think that my coach was, is plays such a big part, like almost as a mother figure in my life. She plays such a big part in my life. And if I didn't have my coach, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't be, if you know me in real life, I'm really bubbly and personal and I like to help out and I'm doing this, everything. I'm always in everything. And I don't think that I would be able to do that without like, without my coach, honestly, I wouldn't be the person I am without my coach and my coach, motivates me and she's the reason that I want to go to school she's the reason why I'm a go-getter why I, why I want to do all of these things and have all these opportunities and I just think that she's really really special and I'm happy that I'm happy to be an advocate for coach for coaches in their futures and I will forever even if when I age out of foster care I will forever be an advocate for coaches because I think they're so so important and I think that I just wanted to give that, that little like tidbit of my life That's into fine. why I think coaches are really important. And that, that's all I wanted to say at the moment, or if you guys have any questions or anything. Thank you, Cheyenne. Uh, um, uh, which which um, agency is your coach affiliated with? Well, I'm, I'm in Hartshire, St. Vincent's, and my coach's name is Lakia. So it's Lakia who's here right now. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's that's uh, it, it's very good to hear. I mean, we're we we know that there's we still have a lot more work to do in terms of getting fair futures on a kind of longer sustainable path in terms of uh, making sure that it's available for 
young people, you know, well into, um, you know, their 20s to, to have that relationship there. Um, and it's the very least that I think we could do as a city to, um, to help transition into adulthood. Uh, it's not easy for anybody to transition into adulthood. I remember transitioning into adulthood. It was not easy for me, so. Um, yeah, exactly. You know. It's really sad that, like, regular kids it's sad to think that i'm not a regular kid i'm just a foster kid but regular kids have you know the, the you're support. an extraordinary kid <laughs> thank you but you know other kids have support of their parents well until they're like 30s but when we turn like what 21 we're just eh, is, we're just we're able to take care of ourselves or whatever that means and we're just trying well for me we advocate for their futures and i want to get a baseline so not eat for me, my generation and the generations after me can can have the benefits and, you know, just be happy and regular. I don't want to lose somebody else in my life that that I, you know, that I, I can't afford it. I can't afford to lose my coach after I turn 21 or age out of foster care. I, I, I just really can't. And it's sad to think that I have to think about one day I'm going to lose my coach. And it's just, it's heartbreaking, at least for me. So I think that relationship I, will, will be there, but it's not going to be the same if I lose my, if I lose my coach, you know, and I'm still young and it's really sad that I have to think about in a few years, I'm going to, what's going to happen to me or, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just sad. I don't want to go through that. Well, we'll do I mean, we'll do whatever we can to, um, to, to keep, to keep up and make sure that we're, we're doing our part and I'll, I'll, I'll keep in touch with our chair and make sure, um, <laughs> that uh, you're getting all the all the resources you need yeah thank you so much it really really means a lot to not my generation but other generations after me too you're looking after, after, yeah there's, yeah there's eight thousand other kids just like me that have the same exact story as me that are scared just like me yeah. you know in in foster care and i'm just happy that we have a lot of well I, advocates and the commissioner and julie farber to like fight for us and speak about our problems fan thank you Thank you for your testimony, and um, uh, I think you're gonna do great things. Thank you. Stick Thank with you it. So much for yeah. listening. You got it. You got it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Cheyenne. Um, before I call on Zakia, I want to acknowledge that we have been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal, and now calling on Zakia Gardner to testify. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. I am Zakia. Uh, right now, I go to Kingsborough. I'm a media arts major. And um, for me, that really would not have been possible had I not had two very essential people in my life. My coach, Aisha, at HeartShare, and my dorm project, College Success Coach, who I recently actually got switched because pandemic wild. But those two people, if I, I was in college for basically no reason at first, I was like, well, I meant to work 40 hours a week and I have to go to college and I'll, I'll become a psychologist because that's what I'm interested in. And then I realized that I was doing terribly because I didn't want to be doing that. If I, my mother that the year before that very spring before I graduated had passed away and my father had a stroke and left him unable to speak right before then. My, the, the relationship with my family, like my grandmother who was my foster parent had just passed to only person was my uncle who things were very tense with. There was not someone to guide me. So for me, in my mind, I was like, let me just get through it. The attitude of just get through it was, I had a one, literally less than one, one GPA. It was one, like literally close to a full percent. It was not a full percent. What is that? If I did not have a coach to literally sit down with me and talk to me and not scrutinize and not try to force therapy and force these things on me and actually humanize me and bring opportunities to me as more optional and as of my volition, I would probably still have the same anti, I don't want to involve myself with the agency. I want to, I'll sign out just like my brother because it'll be easier. I would have not been able to even take advantage of those opportunities had I not had someone to come to me and present all these things that I could be doing with myself and all these potential things that I could be doing. I would still be at this other school per pursuing things I don't care about and doing terribly at it. Now my GPA is literally a 3.8 and she's only going up because I care about what I'm doing now because I've had a tutor to sit and time manage with me and teach me that. I had someone to encourage me to go to therapy and to stop, and stop quitting out on it and stop just, it's too hard. I don't want, I don't want to talk about these things. 
I literally got recently diagnosed with ADHD, which is a revelation for me. I, that was impacting so many things for me. And I would not have ever come to that conclusion. I would have never been able to seek the help or the resources if I didn't have a coach to be like, you should do something about this. This is of your volition. This is only to help you to guide me through those things and not tell me this is what you need to do. And this is how it is to be done. If I hadn't had someone to humanize me in that way, and that didn't give the authoritative, like looming presence that a lot of figures at the agency, unfortunately do kind of give off. I would have still probably with a skimp GPA, I would have still had literally no ambition to do anything. Since then, I've started so many things. I've started to sell my art. I've started to actually create things. I could not have been anywhere near that. Like to think of my coach being changed, like, or, or. I'm expired. Pardon? That's the, uh, that's your time has expired. But keep going. You can keep oh, going. Yeah. That's, that's my end of my point. To think of that, like being, being changed or anything like that. Like there's like, for me, like it worked out because I got to have that. But the question, having it questionable for other kids, like that, that's necessary for people who really genuinely have no one to guide them or no other, no other means of that. So necessary, need it. Thank you. And thank you for, um, uh, for, for being there for other young people. Um, Cause that's, that's that's um that's 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 the, that's how we that's how we get each other through you know this is like it's with everything going on in the world um we we rely on one another to to make it through and for you to do that um uh for other young people is really um admirable and um uh, in addition to to doing all of your your school work which congratulations on thank you absolutely um yeah, keep up the good work. Thank you, Zakia. Now I'll call on Joyce McMillan to deliver testimony. Time starts now. Thank you, Council Member Levin and everyone else who put this panel together today. Um, I wanna just start by saying when school closed and mandated reporting was down, the commissioner did a lot of marketing utilizing fear tactics of children who look like me being unsafe at home. I wanna congratulate the two young ladies who just spoke for their successes, but I do wanna point out that is not the success of most children who enter this system. In New York, 65% of children who enter the foster care system enter for reasons related to neglect. 64% in the United States. 8% of those children enter the system for physical abuse compared to 13% in the United States and everything else in between. Black children represent a larger percentage of foster population than do their general population. Yet ACS, better known in my community as the Family Regulation Destruction System, continues to manipulate foundations and others to financially invest in their decades long failures with many commissioners at the helm as they continue to try to get it right. The biggest problem has been and is still separating poverty from neglect. So I've heard the commissioner say, well, Mr. Hansel, if you and your army of agents can't decipher between poverty and neglect, you should all be fired immediately. Not only are black children removed at disproportionate rates, they remain in foster care longer. The honest answer for the reason of disproportionality is we are still seen as slaves in this country. The 13th Amendment Clause was for us, Black people. After the emancipation, we were locked up for nonsense reasons to continue free labor. That slave mentality has grown into mass incarceration and forced placement, where they destroy children and support failed outcomes by doing all the things we know will create hardships for the very children they claim to protect. The first thing a child needs besides their parents' love is stability. The first thing removed when they enter the foster care system is stability. Children change homes, schools, doctors, and everything else regularly. And every time they change homes, their five senses are interrupted and rise to orange alert. In the foster placements, they see different items of color at their forced new location. 
Children smell different scents at that location. The cleaning products, lotions, seasoning juice, so forth and so on. Their taste, the seasonings, the way the food is cooked and prepared. They hear Time. background noises, music, television shows, the sound of the authoritative figure. Their touch, what they feel, the sheets they sleep on, the material of the couch or the chairs and the table. Their toothbrush at home was made of soft bristles. Now it's medium. In addition to all of the ch those changes, in addition to all of those changes, there is also a change in the rules and regulations of each location. The child is the one needing protection, so they say, when they remove them. But when the case manager, who rarely visits the foster residence, spends time with the hired adult at that residence, they don't even talk to the child they place there. They spend their time talking to that foster adult about the problems the child is having and basically blaming them for the problems after everything we know they are going through emotionally and mentally. The hired adults are happy with ACS. They tolerate their both are not happy with ACS either. They tolerate the bullshit for the check. Children are placed on medication for that poor behavior that we spoke about. And no one knows why they're exhibiting the behaviors. The bottom line is New York's average of removing children for reasons related to neglect, poverty that is framed as neglect is neck and neck with the national average of removals for related circumstances. But the commissioner and all his agents are still confused about that. Children who experience the family destruction system are harmed mentally and emotionally. It doesn't take Einstein to tell you this is wrong and it's being done purposefully because no system built to protect children would do those things and claim not to understand. The failure these children are set up for is designed to lead them into mental institutions and incarceration, making ACS the prerequisite for their next stop, incarceration. The family regulation destruction system is designed to separate families generationally for federal incentives. So I guess in that case, Commissioner Hansel is doing a great job. Commissioner Hansel is doing his part to bring federal dollars into New York so those dollars can be distributed for high priced services that does nothing to support the homes or the family life where the children originated from. To stop disproportionality, we have to rid our society of the false narratives, surveillance and poverty. We can begin by providing financial resources to families instead of paying hired adults after children were removed for reasons that they should have never been removed. We can also begin to utilize mandated reporters to support instead of report. I was happy to hear the commissioner say that earlier, so I hope he supports my next legislation because he said a lot of things today that I don't believe he will really stick to because it's for the aesthetics. Um, mandated reporters are the people mainly who have relationships with the families that they end up reporting leaving people no opportunity to have anyone to speak to and be provided confidentiality and resources for whatever issues they may be facing. No one is happy with this system except those who are benefiting off the backs of it. Right, Jeremy Cohaban? And the rest of the foster care presidents who are so fancy every day? I know I'm not happy. My family was touched by this system 21 years ago. And what they did to my children still reverberates throughout my house today. And I won't stop. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. I'll now call on Jeanette Vega. Time starts now. Hello, um, my name is actually Imani Yvonne Worthy and I work with Jeanette Vega as a parent leader at RISE. And I'm also a parent who has been impacted by a child welfare, by the child welfare system. Um, here is my truth and my reality. On April 19th, 2019, I read a news article about a white actress 
Jenny Molin, who dropped her son on his head. As a result, he wound up having a fractured skull. She talked about how hard it was for her as a mother and that she was so thankful for the staff at the hospital in Manhattan. I remember reading her story and her saying, it was a mother's worst nightmare. I felt some kind of way though, as I read this article, because my nightmare as a mother was double fold. When my son was injured, I became an alleged child abuser. I didn't have time to focus on the devastation of my child's injuries. I was too worried about losing him. I was worried that at just six months, he would go off to be raised by another family, separated from me for something that was unintentional. To this day, I wonder if ACS ever knocked on Jenny Mullen's door. Did they go to the hospital and interrogate her during her emotional turmoil? She had an opportunity to write about her woes in the newspaper. She was able to use her voice. She probably received so much sympathy. I did not. The child welfare system should not be based on punishing parents, namely minority parents, for mistakes. Instead of separating and destroying families, it needs to be here, and if it needs to be here, it should focus to preserve and protect the family dynamic. It should be culturally implicit and respectful of all different backgrounds. It should aim to build stronger communities and to empower families as a whole, not just as one part. Now you'll hear from Jeanette Vega. Thank you so much. All right, I'll now call on Jeanette Vega. Time starts now. Hi everyone, I'm Jeanette Vega, RISE's Assistant Director. At RISE, we work with hundreds of parents throughout the year, parents who have been affected by child welfare that claims to support families in New York City. This is the same system that causes trauma, stress, and shame to the parents and the children. These parents that we work with are also black and brown parents and parents who live in low-income communities who were guilty of poverty, parents who reached out for help and got a hotline call and an investigation from the people they trusted during their hard times in life. When we continue to structure child welfare and family support as they are now, it is to continue a system that is widely recognized as racist in design and impact. ACS helps comes with the child welfare case. Families without cases cannot, cannot access ACS supports. Despite the best intentions people may have working within the system of protecting the well being of children, the child welfare system reproduces cycles of harm and trauma that impacts Black and Brown low income communities. This is unacceptable and must end. At RISE, we hear constantly that families are fearful of the support ACS claims to provide. I'm sure you're hearing the same from your Black and Brown constituents, and you can see it in the numbers. ACS's most recent data shows that families did not utilize ACS funded preventive services during the pandemic, during these most stressful months for families, even though many community organizations were working nonstop to support families. During the pandemic, families need and still basic needs are cleaning supplies for their home. Children are in school and parents have to sanitize on a daily basis. Some parents don't understand technology and are teachers now for their children, but the system punish families for their struggle instead of providing support that is needed to de-escalate these situations. So parents rather hide their struggles than reach out to an agency that is connected to ACS. Obviously, parents do not trust ACS's based services or consider preventive supports to be useful or even relevant to the actual needs that families ask and say they need. It's critical to align city spending with families' real needs and move our dollars into community supports that are not connected with ACS. To be clear, that means to us committing to defund ACS and to start funding our communities. I'm sure the council has heard and seen and heard parents and advocates calling for the abolition of the child welfare system. We know that the current child welfare system does not work and simply calling for the reform for the system will not work either. We are seeking to address the pain, fear, and hurt that people are carrying from a place of compassion, care, and humanity. In our communities, schools, 
sports and school programs, mental health supports, affordable and safe housing, crisis service are often inaccessible I'm or low spot. quality. You rather than target communities conditions than child welfare system targets individual families. What we ask is that one greater investment of city dollars in support strategies such as community-based parent advocates, counselors, and parent advocates for parents navigating children's behavior, educational needs, real supports that families say they want. Creation of a family support hotline that parents can call confidential information about community-based services with parents and advocates designing that protocol and assisting. When we come together with a shared vision, we can transform ways of being. When we come together united in the vision to protect, heal, and build each other, starting with people most impacted by systems, our collective actions have the power to transform the ways we support children, parents, and families in New York City. Not with punishment, surveillance, and separation, but rather censoring families' real needs and rights to access resources, information, and support. RISE and other advocates are proposing today that you, the council, be the first step toward making that vision happen for our families. As parent advocates impacted by child welfare, we are calling out for you. We are calling out for the abolition of the child welfare system. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask a quick question to Imani. Uh, every, how's everything going with your family now? Um, we're fine. We're together again, but it was, it was an, ex it was an experience. Um, how long was your, your child removed from your household? Um, well, um, I want to say around six months, oh but I believe that it could have been cut in half. Um, I remember you saying that, you know, the CPS workers were hard and I can believe that, but as a parent who's been in what I saw, I saw overworked people, overworked and unorganized people. I was more organized than my CPS worker. So everything you said was beautiful. It sounded beautiful, but my reality was completely different. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking about my yeah. family. Yeah, yeah. And best, best to you and your family, you know. And thank you. Thank you for being here to testify and, 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 um, and giving your experience today. Thank you, Imani, and thank you, Jeanette. I'll now call on our next panel. The following panelists will be Taylor Thomas, Ron Richter, Jeremy Kahamban, and Jacinta Arnold. And we'll begin with Taylor Thomas. Time starts now. Taylor, it's, it appears that your audio is not working or is not on. We're, we're seeing you, but we are not hearing you. Okay, Taylor. We are still having technical difficulties, Taylor, with your audio. So we're going to move on to the next panelist at this time and see if we can figure out those technical difficulties. So now I'm gonna call on Ron Richter. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I can be heard and seen. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Levin, for giving me this opportunity, giving JCCA this opportunity. And um, it's a real honor to be able to present with um, advocates uh, like Jeanette Vega and uh, Cheyenne and Zakia and Imani and uh, the administration. Um, I um, am um, uh, 
part of uh, JCCA, which is a um, foster care and um, family services organization in New York City. Um, and I appreciate Joyce McMillan's um, uh, authenticity in her anger with respect to a system that she and um, others uh, think needs to be um, overhauled, changed, jettisoned completely. Um, it's a system that I have worked in since I was a lawyer representing children in family court in 1991 and have played multiple roles in what I agree is a system um, fraught by institutional and systemic racism. Um, my agency spent a good deal of time um, in the pandemic providing direct financial support to families, uh, much like ACS described and found that that ability to provide cash assistance to families who were struggling uh, engendered great trust in ways differently than we had before. And I think that was an important lesson that we learned. Um, I also think that um, the extent to which our unconscious implicit biases affect our work and the time constraints in which child protective specialists and judges are asked to do their work um, is a critical factor in the um, racist outcomes that we have and that training is not enough. Um, while some people think that predictive analytics and predictive risk modeling in child welfare are dangerous, um, they are a tool that may in fact result in outcomes that are better, um, including far fewer children being the subject of investigations than we have now. And reconceiving how we engage in child welfare practice is long overdue. We have been complaining about the kinds of outcomes we've had. And I would urge the council to look into um, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, and Denver, Colorado, and Los Angeles, California, where we are using, or they are using, social science in a different modern way to reduce investigations and to more accurately pinpoint children who are truly at risk. Again, not uncontroversial, but different and more modern and nets uh, probably more white children being in the system, but a far more objective approach, mixing social science with human error, which is why we have the, the, the biased outcomes that we've been seeing from when there were 50,000 children in care to when there are 8,500 children in care. Same disproportionate number of black children. So I would urge you uh, Councilman Levin, to focus on shifting the way we do our child welfare work and use science that has advanced in the last 30 years. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Ron. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look into uh, those other counties. Thank you, Ron. I'll now call on Jeremy Kamban from the Children's Village. Starting time. Um, thank you, Chair Levin and other council members for this opportunity, and also for those who've already provided really powerful and important testimony. My name is Jamila Bokum. I'm the Vice President for Advancement at the Children's Village, and I will be sharing some prepared testimony on behalf of Dr. Jeremy Cahumban, the President and CEO of the Children's Village, and also President of Harlem Dowling, two organizations founded in New York City in the early 1800s. Um, racial disparities in child welfare are a data supported fact. We often see black children separated from their families faster. They penetrate the system to higher levels of care faster. They stay longer. And among those children aging out at 18 or 21, black children exit with the worst outcomes. The facts are clear. If you are born to a poor family of color and live in one of our intentionally and deeply segregated communities with what we know are poorly resourced and failing schools, you are target for family separation. 
There are times when children must be separated from family, but it does not need to happen as often as it does. Thanks to the leadership of Commissioner Hansel, um, we are taking bold steps, we believe, to reverse decades of practice. However, the power of implicit bias, the very real problems called, caused by um, racial segregation, and the fear among frontline staff, frankly, of making the wrong decision will continue to needlessly separate families of color. While we wait for the political will to create racially integrated in a more equitable city, um, here are three actions that can reduce the racial disparities. First is continue to invest in prevention services. Second is invest in family enrichment centers. Um, our segregated communities need safe and beautiful spaces staffed by locally credible and skilled staff. Our three family enrichment centers are doing that beautifully um, and we need more. Finally, create residential programs that provide the entire family the opportunity to participate in substance abuse treatment. About 30% of families touched by child welfare report at least one parent dealing with substance abuse. Among middle class and wealthy families, parent substance abuse does not usually lead to family separation because they have financial resources and people in their lives to help protect children. Um, however, among poor and socially isolated families, parent substance abuse is a very real risk because drugs can compromise the natural instincts that parents have to protect their children. The bottom line is substance abuse is a disease that can be treated. Um, evidence supports the efficacy of family inclusion in substance abuse treatment, and children who watch their parents fight the disease can be powerful support in the treatment process. And being part of the treatment process allows children to rebuild their own resilience. Recent federal funding um, through the Family First Prevention Services Act provides us the opportunity to develop this essential capacity in New York. What children need most is the love and belonging of family. Needless separation is destructive. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you Jamila. I'll now call on Jacinta Ernal. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon. If you can reset the clock, that would be greatly appreciated. I was just released from the mute um, functionality on Zoom. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacinta Erno, and I'd like to thank um, the chairman, Stephen Levins, for the opportunity to share the realities of child welfare and family court racial uh, hatred, bigotry, and gender-based violence that uh, unfortunately uh, the smoke screen is there, but the fire is not being uh, removed. I am currently impacted uh, by the child welfare system. And so as I listened to the lullaby stories and uh, Broadway production show, I, want, I was nauseated. I certainly do not feel that I have the liberty or the options uh, to benefit from any of these uh, mysterious services that are available for families. My family have been um, impacted for the last 22 months. Uh, my children, I have not been able to see my children physically or in person for the last 10 months. I have been forced or coerced, uh, degraded, humiliated, demoralized, um, undermined, and made out to be um, uh, characterized as intellectually dis developmentally disabled and reduced to infant-like functionality um, unable to care for my children. And I am in, a, I am in quite shock as a uh, system science industrial engineer, not with one degree, but three degrees, independently own my own company to honestly not to see the uh, judicial malicious prosecution, to see the corruption, healthcare fraud, and the money scandals go unac um, unaccountable for, 
uh, to impact my children, to teach them to disassociate themselves from me, to teach them that I'm a threat to them, to uh, not provide services and to not be held accountable is astonishing that this is a multi-billion dollar, uh, what I would call a Rico cartel family that dominates the black and brown communities and literally terrifies anyone that speak up for themselves. I was told, uh, do I know how to be timid? I was told to not use a black therapist. I was told that I, my parents should no longer have interaction with my children. My father was, is, is a retired sergeant uh, from the New York City Police Department. And he was told he was too old to keep up with the children. I am highly disgusted and disappointed that the city council and the uh, ACS fraudulent um, baby hospital uh, to prison pipeline has not stopped. This is not about a matter of giving training. These people literally need to be fired and held to the same standards of the criminal reform. I am looking for uh, body cams. We're looking to apply the same reform for, uh, for the criminal justice system I'm to explaining. apply to CPS criminal justice system. Um, this is, there is nothing civil about CPS. We are tra treated like inmates. We're um, and the conditions are unbefitted for even animals to survive. And my heart goes out to those two young ladies who need ongoing support because they, they want the coaches. Well, understand that my children have a loving, caring mother who uh, come from a two-parent home and also uh, a father from a two-parent home. And ACS will rather pay a foster care stranger money to take care of my kids, where it almost ended up in a criminal activity because we have over 50 family members and there was no need for ACS intervention to not offer us the court order supervision as they offer the white and Asian children and to forcibly put my children into foster care. Not only am I disgusted, I am angry that I have called everyone within ACS, no one answers the telephone, no one responds to emails, you get sent around when you contact the ACS ombuds group, they literally cycle you back through the most abusive predatory uh, sex offenders who, who, who invest in human trafficking of children. I am disgusted to know that my children have to go on political asylum to the state of Virginia to prevent them from being put into a stranger's house because you have a case so social worker by the name of Jennifer Goldstein who said she could lie to the judge and get away with it. So ACS has been known to twist children testimonies around to twist and mess to mess represents doctor um, medical records as well as uh, clinicians um, third party collateral uh, support this system is not broken it is designed for mass incarceration poverty homelessness drug abuse and gang association and the fact that we're sitting here and gave them two hours to put everyone to sleep with a lullaby story is a shame on everyone because it's a complicit straight up racist bigotry system i have ever met and what i would like to know is when are they going to return my children i um have not only own one home i own several homes and I was told to sell my million dollar property to invest into the most fraudulent uh, child welfare system, which is equivalent to a Jerry Springer show. So I'm looking for the resources to speak to someone about returning my children to complying with the court orders and to provide the child wealth services that were said to be offered to all, but only to certain zip codes. This situation is no different than the coronavirus. When we had the first initiation of the PPE mask, the black communities were beaten. They were assaulted and arrested and they were institutionalized for the beginning of the coronavirus. In comparison to the affluent communities, they were incentivized and encouraged to use the mask. And so you see the same perils that exist in the Department of Education. You see it exists in the rollout of coronavirus that however, the coronavirus pandemic not only uh, illustrated um, the inequities of child well welfare system, Dave Hansel should be fired um, from his position. Uh, Avila should be fired. Ms. Neji Barad should be fired. Mr. Constance and Mr. Pora, 
never should anyone hang the phone up on me and I have to call the police to get involved because of kidnapping and not letting me know where my children are. <clears throat> and according to the ACS handbook, if it's outdated, we need to get an updated copy. Why am I not allowed to read to my children, to do homework with my children, to be involved in their life? My children are not off. They come from a very well-founded uh, family that is un that is privileged and is not poor. So this situation is not even about poverty. It's not even about drug abuse. You can check all my medical records. The fact that I've been coerced to take eight mental health evaluations, a series of mental health evaluations that is not needed, but all prove there is nothing wrong with me that I do not need medication, but CPS and ACS General Counsel have took it upon themselves to become medical doctors without the license, the training, or the requirements to certify, diagnose, prescribe, and recommend that I get on drugs in order to get my kids back, which is equivalent to the opioid epidemic where people are taking the positions of physicians to prescribe medication. They put little girls in position of college uh, graduate students with no Just, lived experience, no children, Christina, and work as debutantes. To, to harass and, and torture the community. I'm Justina, sorry, if you I'm just gonna, allow I'm, me, because I just listened to two hours of a lullaby story, and I am outraged that I have not been able to see my children when everyone else but, has been able to see their children or return them back. Thank you. Understood. Justina, I, I, um, if we could uh, follow up from this testimony um, uh, in the coming days, I'm happy to uh, talk with you uh, and and go through um, the specific the specifics of your situation and, and, and work with you. Yeah, I went so, to your uh, office in Brooklyn since 2019, and I did not receive any help. My case should have never taken 22 years. I should have never been extorted for 3,000 a month. My parents shouldn't have been extorted for 300,000. This is a scandal, and we are outraged. There should not be government immunity granted to the CPS case workers. They should carry license insurance just like the medical doctors. And they need to, we need universal justice. The same body cams that the police officers have to wear, the CPS advisors should have to wear them as well. This is a very corrupted, um, inhumane, just cruel system that is not even, uh, that is unbefitting for the. So, Justina, um, if you've spoken with my staff, I'll, I'll follow up with them and, and uh, make, they, you, they have your contact information? Um. I, uh, I spoke to Elizabeth Adam in 2019, and I will okay. certainly like to speak to you again, and also yep. with Dave Hansel's team. I was told that I need attorneys to speak to their team. They refuse to talk to my family and I, and they cherry pick parents they want to speak to. So it's a complete okay. white supremacist brainwashing sort of um, e epidemic. Justina, I, I will follow. I will follow up with with Elizabeth, and, and we'll be we'll be in touch with you. Okay. And, and I hope before because my, my son's birthday just passed and he could not spend time with his mother and my daughter's yeah. birthday coming up as well. I would like to have a turnaround answer within 24 hours if possibly. It's been two okay. years. Okay, and if you don't if you don't hear from me, feel free to reach send me an email as well if if I if we don't if I if we're unable to locate your contact information and we'll, we'll I will follow up with you. I, I I commit to that. And not only a follow, I'm looking for answers. Well, I, I will do whatever I, I'll do whatever I can. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Thank you, Jacinta. I'm now going to call again Taylor Thomas. Starting time. All right. It appears that Taylor is not is not with us at this time, so. We will circle back. I will now call up our, our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order. Jim Purcell, Damon Kelly, Tara Coles, and Tayora Graves. And we're going to begin with Jim Purcell. Starting time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Levin, for this opportunity. Uh, we submitted testimony, of course, and I won't go through all of it. Um, the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, as you know, represents uh, all of the prevention services and the foster care agencies in New York City and, and most of them across the state. Um, I think uh, I want to commend the committee and, and you as chair for convening this discussion. 
Um, this is an issue that we need to talk about. We need to take action on. Um, and I, it, it's, a, it's as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, the disproportionality impact on especially the black community is true not only in New York City, but in every large urban area of the country. And I think the events of this summer have caused everyone to reconsider uh, what we do and how this system functions. Um, I, I just want to touch on a couple of points. Um, first, I think that the commissioner, uh, my view is the commissioner did a good job in his presentation today. Uh, ACS has taken a number of groundbreaking steps to um, to make the work that we all do uh, more uh, effective. Um, they, the, the reduction in the number of children in foster care, um, I was around when it was 51,000 and, and 30 years ago. It's, uh, I never thought I'd see the numbers this low. It's an amazing success. Um, and we've got more to do. Until, the, uh, until COVID shut everything down, we were continuing to see fewer kids in foster care literally every month. That's reversed in the last couple of months, mostly because the courts have not been open for the most part. Um, but even there, uh, our agencies have been working with the city where possible to return kids home um, uh, pending court orders uh, when, they, uh, when they reopen. Um, I need to give another shout out. Someone mentioned it earlier, but the biggest reform in the whole system that I have seen in all the time I've been involved in it uh, was Senator Montgomery's uh, bill last year, which is now law, which changes the level of evidence used in child protective investigations. Some credible evidence is a level so low, most attorneys don't quite know what it is. S some credible evidence means it could have happened. That is no basis for indicating a case against a family and changing it to a preponderance of the evidence, which is what 42 other states have been using, uh, it, I think will have a considerable impact on how this system functions. It's unfortunate it's gonna take another year to get implemented, but I think we should be moving on it as quickly as we can. I also wanna uh, follow up on a comment that uh, Ron Richter made, which is that um, I think we've all learned a lot through COVID. Um, I just was on a panel uh, nationally and pointed out that I think during the early months, especially of COVID, our caseworkers in prevention and foster care spent more time uh, delivering laptops, uh, making sure people had groceries uh, and cleaning supplies uh, than the kinds of work that we traditionally do. And as Ron pointed out, it has improved the connections and the relationships uh, as families were able to see the staff of these agencies providing real hands-on help. Uh, I just, I'll close by saying that our board of directors at uh, Kafka has uh, taken on uh, racial justice as a top priority. Um, and the chair of uh, one of the three co-chairs of that group is Damon Kelly, um, who I think will speak next, who is the uh, uh, executive director of Lutheran Social Services. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to call now on Damon Kelly. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Levin. My name is Damon Kelly, uh, Dr. Damon Kelly, and I'm the President and CEO of Lutheran Social Services of New York, as well as Jim indicated, the co-chair of the Racial Justice Committee of Kafka. Um, you know, we, we sit in this hearing, and I've heard a lot of the comments made by the individuals who have spoken already, and we need to understand that we are working in a system that has, has its roots uh, in systemic and institutional racism. But that doesn't mean that there haven't been advancements or changes to reduce the impact of race as part of the uh, foster care system. We, we've learned over the past couple of months because of the pandemic, the impact of race in our everyday lives. And I think what has happened is that a lot of people were, wed, were led to believe that incidents of racism decreased because we elected the first black president. We as a society, as a system, cannot be afraid to talk about racial issues. And I will give ACS credit for one thing. 
that they are one of the few city agencies and Lutheran Social Service uh, is a multi-service organization who has contracts with many uh, different city agencies. ACS is one of the only city agencies that has regularly had conversations about the racial impact of their programs and services and that they need, they deserve credit for. Um, I also want to say in, in response to Ms. Vega and Ms. Amani's uh, comments that the family enrichment centers are a perfect way to get those community supports to individuals in need. Um, I was one of the developers and implementers of the first family enrichment center in the South Ward of Newark, New Jersey, where this concept in New York has basically come from. And I, and I will tell you, the intimate contact of those centers with members of the community makes a big difference. As Jim indicated, my staff have been delivering laptops, have been delivering food, have been delivering masks, have been delivering all types of supplies to the families we work with. And so we understand that part of this work involves true community engagement. It's not perfect. We don't live in a perfect society. We don't live in a colorblind society. But I have to give ACS credit for being one of the few agencies who recognize the racial impact and are doing something about it. I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. You could you could uh, um, finish if if you have more. No, I'll, I'll defer, and, and no other people need to speak. Thank you. All right. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Kelly. I'll now call on Tara Coles. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tara Coles. I'm a litigation supervisor um, at the Center for Family Representation. CFR represents about 3,000 parents in Queens and Manhattan every year. And every year, at least 90% of those clients are black, brown, or people of color. They're all poor. Many of them are um, suffering from um, a lack of access to proper medical care. Um, many face housing insecurity. And most of them are unfamiliar with how the family regulation system works. There have been many, of time, many times in my career where my client and I are the only black people in the courtroom. We know that the separation of children from their parents or even the threat of it is among the most potentially consequential, dramatic and harmful acts that the government can take. This authority that the government has should bring with it the protections that provide necessary counterweights to that power. This is especially true in a system that by all accounts targets, investigates, and separates families of color. When families of means are investigated, they have access to information by virtue of their privilege and the ability to obtain support when people who are poor do not. Information is power and sharing information connotes respect. Those in power often withhold information as a weapon of control, often under the guise of looking out for the greater good. Currently, ACS is opposed to this giving parents this information. The impact of this is that parents are kept in the dark about their rights when being investigated by the city. The city disempowers parents and fails to show them respect by limiting and trying to control their choices during investigations. If the city were interested in empowering parents and respecting them, they would explain to them during an investigation that no, they don't have to allow their child to be stripped and physically examined by the worker who just showed up at their doorstep, that no, they don't have to sign a blank medical release, that they don't have to tell them the intimate details of their private lives, but that yes, anything they say or um, anything that they say could be used against them in a petition or an application to remove their child. To be clear, the allegations that most of the petitions we see in family court include are related to poverty, but other examples include that parents co-sleep with their babies or that they smoke marijuana or that they had a fight in the presence of their child. We know that the cities and others have opposed giving parents this information and that the arguments that they have are very similar to what we hear from those opposed to reforms in the policing system. If you make this change, then we can't do our job. 
The city has also claimed that requiring CPS workers to inform parents of their rights would turn an investigation into something more like a police encounter. Well, to the extent Time that systemic racism is in part characterized by a lack of awareness on the part of those in power, this too reflects an ignorance of what we hear from parents all the time and what we have all been hearing today from parents, that ACS is not viewed well in communities. For many parents, ACS is the police, perhaps worse because of the stakes. The city has also said that giving this information would potentially interfere with an investigation, but that is not our experience when we can intervene early. ACS always has the power to remove children if it believes a threat of harm to a child is imminent. Access to information and legal and social work support just means a parent has the support of when facing a large and powerful government force. This is why we urge the city council to immediately pass a resolution calling for calling on the state legislature to pass the Miranda bill also sponsored by Senator Montgomery um, pending in the Senate now. Um, we know that there's also similar legislation, um, I believe introduced by you, Chair Levin, um, about requiring rights to be given to parents at first point of contact. Um, these are things that could be done now, that could help families now that are suffering from this system that is plagued by systemic racism. The system cannot support and respect parents of color while also per per perpetuating systemic racism when, by refusing to give unbiased information to parents when they are being investigated. The city does not deny that it prosecutes black and brown people at a higher rate than any other group, but it, if, it's, if it is not required to inform those it investigates of even their most basic rights, it further disempowers them and harms black and brown parents and their children. Disempowerment is a hallmark of systemic racism. One that information can at least help to address. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coles. Thank you. Ms. Coles, I'm going to call on Teora Graves, followed by Taylor Thomas. Teora before that, I just starting to. Oh, before oh. that, I just wanted to acknowledge we had two birthdays uh, from uh, people who just testified: uh, Jim Purcell and Ron Richter, both celebrated birthdays in the last couple of days. Happy birthdays. Now, turning it over uh, to Ms. Grace. Good afternoon. Sorry. My name is Sarah Graves and I am a senior parent advocate for the Center for Family Representation or CFR. I am also an impacted parent. Over the past 11 years, I have seen that not only does the system disproportionately impact black and brown families, but once caught in the system, families are not treated with the respect they deserve. Over the past several years working as a parent advocate, I have personally seen how dehumanizing and racist the system continues to be when it comes to people who look like me. A prime example of this is how our children are treated when they are removed from our care and sent to the children's center where they await placement. We have clients who teenage children are placed in the children's center and then allowed to come and go as they please without their parents being informed. We have heard reports of some children engaging in prostitution. Parents who have been accused of neglect are not taken seriously when they raise these concerns. Rather, they are treated as if they have forfeited their right to be outraged that their children are at risk. The lack of respect in the racist overtones extends into the system the whole system, including ACS conferences and in court. I have personally observed a parent repeatedly being asked by a caseworker whether she was pregnant by the same father of her older daughter. When my client repeatedly said that the baby had the same father, the worker eventually said, wow, that's a first. One of our CFR clients was repeatedly asked if he was sure that he was the father of the child. One ACS prosecutor called our client selfish for seeking visits with her child during the pandemic. We have seen favorable settlements offers be withheld even for parents who have their children at home and who are fully compliant in service plans because to quote one ACS prosecutor, they are young and they may have more children in the future. So they want a finding of neglect to be made on the record. One CFR client was told by a caseworker at a conference that she was trying to sound more white because of how she pronounced her last name. There are more examples like this. And we know that parent advocates from across the city have similar experiences. These examples reflect the racism and the disrespect that those caught in the family regulation system face on a daily basis. 
This system that presents itself as caring about children and families, in reality, it disproportionately targets black and brown families and then, fail, and then fails to treat them with respect. For race and equality issues, it cannot be business as usual at ACS. Our experience is that some problems are acknowledged by ACS leadership. However, the policies and initiatives that have launched to fail to trickle down to where it matters. We urge the city council to create a standing commission independent of ACS to be tasked with the responsibility of reviewing and approving existing and proposed policies that have the goal of dismantling and addressing racist remarks and behaviors. The commission must have decision-making authority and the city must commit to implement their recommendations. The commission must be made up of families and youth who have been directly impacted by the system in addition to the advocates and ACS representatives. The damage the system has done and continues to do to black families has gone unchecked for way too long. Families deserve voice and choice when it comes to what happens with their families. Thank you. Ms. Grace, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Uh, you mentioned something about the, the, um, those policies trickling down um, to frontline staff. And I, I asked a little bit about that with, with regard to um, ACS attorneys. Um, is that something, I mean, is there, is that something you see a lot of? That it's that it's just that the um, you know the attitude of frontline staff or the the actions taken by frontline staff are just not income you know not um, don't match up with with what we're hearing from leadership. Yes, it is, and I actually am a member of the commission that the commissioner mentioned, Commissioner Hansel mentioned, and we are working have. Um, disclosed and, and been very transparent that we are frontline staff, we are boots to the ground staff, we are seeing what happens and our families are experiencing these things. And when we're bringing up policies, a lot of the times FCLS or the ACS prosecutors, they look to these caseworkers to provide them with information. So if the case, if the caseworker doesn't have it, then it, it doesn't get implemented in court. So unfortunately that is true. And that, that is something that we have discussed and continue and, and we're willing to continue to discuss at the table with the commissioner and the rest of the cabinet. Um, do you see issues in terms of like the structure of F FCLS um, in terms of how um, they are uh, implementing kind of policy? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to sometimes to match up kind of Big, big picture policy when when there are individual cases, you know, being litigated. But um, do you see that as kind of more uh, as a significant mismatch there in terms of those two, you know, sets of priorities? Yes, in the better part of last year, I actually joined with Jeanette Vega from Rise Magazine and did training for her new and incoming FCLS attorneys. And one of the things that was very disheartening was from the gate, from the training, from the door where they enter into the system, they were not discouraged on using race, um, you know, poverty, things like that, implementing into the programs and the systems and even the policies that they were talking about. Um, it was actually encouraged to um, dehumanize a parent as coming late um, and things like that. So I definitely think from the door and from the training um, standpoint, there's definitely a mismatch. Okay. That's something to, just to, I think that we should be looking at because um, a lot, they have a lot of discretion, a lot of power. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank, you. Thank you, Ms. Graves. I'll now call on Taylor Thomas. Already time. Hello. We can hear you, Taylor. Hi. Okay. Thank you so much um, for working with me through the technical difficulties. I apologize. Um, and I also want to take a moment to thank the council for the opportunity to share on this platform. Um, so my name is Taylor Thomas. Um, I want to also say that I am a social worker and I do work for a nonprofit in the Bronx. Um, and my story began 
you know, me and my partner, Joseph, and I became involved with ACS on June 1st after our daughter, who was four months old at that time, fell from our bed. I was at work and, you know, Joseph called me to tell me what had happened. And I, I immediately rushed to meet him and my daughter, Blair, at the hospital, at, um, at Montefiore Hospital. We brought our daughter there because we wanted to make sure she was okay. She had fallen off from our bed and our main concern was making sure that we get her attention. And we put our trust in the medical professionals there at Montefiore. Um, but what we were met with was a humiliating and criminalizing process when we were then reported to the state central registry and accused of child abuse. And that treatment from of my family and I, that my family and I experienced from the medical professionals there, and then subsequently the administration of children's services has left our family traumatized. And from what I am confident is varying forms of institutional racism. I have said, and I can honestly say to this day that I have never felt more blacker in my life than I did in the emergency room and the days that followed after ACS became involved. My daughter at that time received no medical treatment during our three-day stay at Montefiore, but we were seen by multiple social workers and the New York City Police Department Bronx Child Abuse Squad who were sent to interview me. I was questioned about my family and the most intimate details of my life again and again. And rather than being treated with compassion and care, I was integrated and talked down to. It was the most embarrassing, intimidating, and ter terrifying experience of my life, especially considering that I was in a room during the height of COVID with other mothers and families having to endure this line of questioning. The fact that the hospital suspected me of child abuse was never outright confirmed with words, but through their actions. Though I was questioned repeatedly, the basic questions that I asked hospital staff who were in charge of the, well, the medical well-being of my child and whether I was going to be okay, those went unanswered. And I was treated not as a patient's mother, but as a criminal. ACS then followed the hospital's lead and rushed to conclusions about my family, who we were, disregarded every good thing about Joseph and myself and our role and us as Blair's parents, like our loving partnership and our, the preparations we had made for our daughter. ACS recommended that my daughter immediately be placed into foster care without even considering that my family had strong kinship ties and a large network of support. Ultimately, I was allowed to live with Blair, but under my mother's supervision, and my partner, Joseph, he was forced to leave our home. In my meetings with ACS and Preventative Services, I discussed my belief that the child welfare system has always been designed to destabilize families of color, put fathers in absentee roles, and criminalize Black women. My experience has shown me that this is correct. This is how the child welfare system has functioned in my life. This is how the system is designed. This is how it's impacted Joseph's life and, more importantly, my daughter's life. I'm afraid to stand up for my family because when I have defended myself and my family to ACS, I was called intimidating and difficult, in a, which is a clear example in my mind as a microaggression. As a woman in African American, I, am un I have unfortunately learned to be careful now in how I advocate for myself and my family, because I am all too aware I hold no power over ACS. Instead, they have the power to destroy my family like they have so many others. This experience has driven home for me that despite the love and care Joseph, I Joseph and I have for our daughter, despite our stability of a two-parent household, despite our college education and employment, I am seen primarily as Black and therefore inherently suspect by the child welfare system. Despite our efforts, we are still subject to overwhelming forces of institutional racism. And this experience has humbled me and has served as a stark reminder of my Blackness. After two months, at a two-month-long hearing, uh, Joseph 
was able to reunite with our family and we feel we've been vindicated. However, to this day, getting a knock on the door scares us. We're absolutely terrified that our child will be stolen from us by ACS and really is a clear indication of the trauma that we've experienced. We've accepted that an unfortunate accident happens on June 1st, but we do not and will not accept the outdated, racist, and oppressive policies and practices of the child welfare system. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Thomas. I, I think um, that's some of the most impactful testimony that I've, I've heard in a very long time. Um, and um, I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that there's a, a parent out there that hasn't had their child fall down and um, wanted to call their doctor or call the hospital. Um, and the fact that you did that you know, to make sure that your child was okay, because I know the feeling, um, and to be treated that way, and to um, for that treatment to not to, to turn into a nightmare, to an ongoing nightmare. I mean, that you, um, it's been five months since you since that's happened. That's um, I can only imagine. So I want to thank you for. Um, for testifying and um, if there's any way we could keep in touch, I'd, 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 I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and thank you for saying that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas, for your testimony. I'm now gonna call on our next panel. In the following order, we will hear from M. Mena, Dawn Mitchell, Brian Jones and Miriam Mack. And we are going to begin with M. Mena. Sorry, uh, I meant to, I just, sorry, one more question for Ms. Thomas. I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Thomas, did you have legal representation in all of this? I don't know if you're still there. Did you have legal Hi, representation? Hi. I did. I did. I'm actually, I continue to have just the amazing support um, from the Bronx Defenders. Okay. Um, super, really, really amazing support. Okay, that's very good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Ms. Thomas. I'm going to call now on M. Mena. Hard in time. Good afternoon. My name is M. Mena and I am a policy and budget analyst at CCC, a multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Thank you, Chair um, Levin and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. In our testimony, we highlight the disparate impact of COVID-19 on Black and Latinx communities. We highlight as well the fact that poverty is a significant driver of, the child, of child welfare involvement. In New York City, Black and Latinx families have, have uh, some of the highest poverty rates in the city. Um, they make up 80% of child welfare investigations and 89% of the foster care population, despite being 57% of New York's child population. Finally, we also discuss, um, or, uh, sorry, draw attention to the critical role that preventive service system has played in responding to the heightened needs of families during the pandemic. There is a need not only for continued monitoring of the new preventive service contracts put in place on July 1st, but also to assure that the system will be protected from state and local budget cuts in the coming month and year. According to a recent report by UHF, 2,400 Black and Latinx children from the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn lost at least one parent in the first few months of the pandemic. This figure represents 57% of parental loss for the entire state of New York. The majority of these deaths in the city are concentrated in communities of color and immigrant households that were already struggling with poverty, housing, excuse me, housing instability and poor health. Also 325,000 children have been plunged into or near poverty, 
a figure that should worry us considering that the city was already grappling with more than one in five children living in or near poverty. We are concerned about the safety, stability, and well being of Black, Latinx, and immigrant children and their families as a result of worsened economic and social conditions due to the pandemic, the related economic fallout, and declining referrals to preventive services. There is a relationship between high rates of child welfare involvement and high rates of poverty, such as community districts in the Bronx, where over 54% of children in districts like Mott Haven and Hunts Point live in poverty, um, while in Manhattan's Lower East Side, over 43% of children live in poverty, and in Brooklyn's Bushwick uh, district, 42% of children live in poverty. And I'm just highlighting a few of the districts with the uh, highest poverty rates. New York City has one of, um, New York City also has one of the largest preventive service systems in the country, offering diverse services that prevent foster care placement. Since 2007, the number of children in foster care has decreased steadily. It behooves us to ensure that all of New York's children and their families are safe and well resourced. We believe pandemic recovery requires protecting and expanding investments in child welfare prevention. We encourage the committee and all council members to champion this effort to protect these crucial resources and to redouble their efforts to address the racial disparities in the city's child welfare system. CCC looks forward to a continued partnership with the committee to improve outcomes, especially for Black, Latinx, and immigrant families. Thank you. Thank you, M. I will now call on Don Mitchell. Starting time. This is Chief Sergeant Terrence Raphael Perez. It appears that we can't hear Ms. Dawn Mitchell. You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. All right, we're gonna circle back to Dawn and we'll move on to Brian Jones at this time. Starting time. Hi, good evening. My name is Brian Jones and I'm a senior attorney with the Family Defense Practice our Brooklyn Defender Services. Every year, our family defense practice represents 4,000 parents in family court and over 600 parents who are facing an ACS investigation. Thank you to the New York City Council's General Welfare Committee for holding today's important hearing. I am a member of BDS's early defense team, which provides advocacy to parents during the initial stages of an ACS investigation. Our early defense practice would not be possible without the generous support of city council, and we are thankful for that. Our goal as a practice is to avoid court filings and to avoid children being separated from their families. Cases involving common family problems, such as drug or alcohol use, or living with a mental health condition should be resolved outside of court, as they are for families who enjoy racial and economic privilege or who live in neighborhoods that have little or no ACS surveillance. Our advocates connect with parents during one of the most frightening moments for their family, when they feel pressured to say yes to anything an ACS worker asks. With our help, parents better understand what an ACS investigation looks like, who the players are, and the risks that are involved. In our experience, parents are often very willing to engage with ACS, but only once they understand the process and their rights. Early defense and right to counsel is a racial equity issue. Parents who are black and brown deserve legal advice and representation when ACS is involved in their lives, just like more resource families have. ACS has opposed this right to counsel at this stage, and if ACS truly believes in racial equity, then they should support our parents' right to counsel during this investigative stage. Unfortunately for families of color though, an ACS investigation too often leads to a family court case and a system played with inequities and delays that often results in the removals of children, fact-finding hearings that take years to resolve, 
and foster care placements that unnecessarily last years on end. When litigants enter family court, they are greeted by metal detectors and armed court officers. The presence of court officers escalates rather than de-escalates the very emotional and tense dynamics in family court. Under the pretext of maintaining order and protecting children, armed court officers and judges alike respond to parents who are emotional as though they pose threats to the courthouse. The presence of armed court officers is yet another reminder that the family regulation system polices and controls communities of color. We are asking the council to enact bills that provide parents with support, not surveillance, and make ACS accountable to the communities it serves. And we agree with the chair that a crucial part of limiting ACS investigations is providing trainings to mandated reporters to educate them about the implications for ACS investigations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Brian. I will now call on Miriam Mack. Starting time. Here's we have either lost Miriam on, on this on con connection, but we will circle back. I'll now circle back again to Don Mitchell. Starting time. Yeah, we're not hearing you, Ms. Mitchell. We're, no. we're, we're not hearing anything on audio on our end. We see you, but we cannot hear you. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to circle back. At this time, I will call up our next panel. Our next panel in the following order will be Carla Johnson, Helen Montalvan, Zachary Ahmad, and Karen Friedman. We're going to start with Carla Johnson. Starting time. Hi there. Bear with me. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Carla Johnson, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Kinship Caregiver Law Project and Mobilization for Justice, Inc., also known as MFJ. MFJ's Kinship Caregiver Law Project helps stabilize families by providing civil legal assistance to caregivers raising children who are not biologically their own. MFJ works to prevent these children from entering the traditional foster care system by representing caregivers in custody, guardianship, and adoption proceedings. MFJ's Kinship Caregiver Law Project is the only program in New York City that exists solely to assist kinship caregivers with their legal needs. Research shows that Black and Latinx families and children who are living in poverty have heightened exposure to social service systems, increasing their exposure to mandated reporters and the child welfare system. According to the National Conference on State Legislatures, 33% of, of, of kids in foster care are African-American, but they only make up 15% of the child population. Families experience a myriad of challenges to bring these children into their homes which has only been exacerbated by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. When a child enters the child welfare system, a kinship caregiver is sometimes given the option of being certified as a kinship foster parent, which provides the caregiver and the child with monetary benefits. However, kinship caregivers are more often not certified as foster parents. This burdens families of color who already struggle against a child welfare system created to police not to help. At a time when families are experiencing severe financial strain, all options should be available to help minimize families slipping into poverty, as has previously been discussed, including but not limited to increasing temporary assistance for needy families or TANF funding for children in kinship care. 
kinship caregivers are more likely to take an entire sibling group uh, take in entire uh, sibling groups, thus ensuring that siblings are raised together. However, when this happens outside the foster care system, kinship caregivers are effectively punished for taking in more children as the amount of child-only TANF funding radically decreases per child. By increasing TANF child-only grants, this will help families that are diverted out of the foster care system to have access to public assistance that is more equitable to a foster care subsidy. In this moment of nationwide reckoning of racial injustice, it is imperative that changes in the child welfare system be at the forefront of the conversation. As we move towards the end of 2020 and are now eight months into the pandemic, research has begun to reveal the devastating effects of COVID-19 on our city, state, and nation economies, as well as our communities. We now know both nationally and within New York, Black I'm and Latinx explaining. individuals um, including children contract the virus at a disproportionate rate um, in comparison to white individuals. Researchers, research has also shed a light on the collateral effects of the COVID, that COVID-19 has had on family units. 4,200 children in New York State lost a parent or caregiver to coronavirus between March and July 2020, exceeding the number of children who lost a parent in the wake of 9-11. Black and Latinx children experience the death of a parent or caregiver due to COVID-19 at double the rate of their white and Asian peers. In the midst of the current pandemic, a, a parent or caregiver's death by COVID-19 engenders even greater hardships, adding to existing trauma, stress, and need for low and no income New York families. Upwards of 23 children who have lost a parent or caregiver due to COVID-19 may be at risk of entering into the foster or kinship care system. And approximately 50% of children who lost a caregiver due to COVID-19 may enter poverty. Pre-pandemic, Black and Latinx children were particularly vulnerable to encounters with the family welfare system, largely in part due to over-policing of Black and Brown parents. Despite data reflecting the realities of Black and Latinx children's increased risk of being placed in the child welfare system during these, this unprecedented time, we have seen aunts, uncles, grandparents, siblings, and other family members and next of kin step up to keep families together and out of the traditional foster care system. In light of the compounding effects of COVID-19 on Black and Latinx families, we propose that the General Welfare Committee endeavor Time to expired. keep more families together through kinship placement and provide the necessary supports to those families by one, ensuring access to counsel for kinship caregivers, two, providing sufficient financial resources and safety net supports to kinship caregivers, including increased TANF funding to match foster care subsidies. Three, provide sufficient and timely information to current and potential kinship caregivers via a neutral third party regarding foster parent certification. And four, providing sufficient supportive services in this pandemic era to young people of color. COVID-19 has exacerbated pre-existing racial disparities in the child welfare system. Mobilization for Justice Inc. respectfully urges the General Welfare Committee to implement these recommendations to begin to address disparities throughout the child welfare system to ensure better outcomes for Black and Latinx children, tragically and often unnecessarily foisted into the child welfare system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I also just want to remind our panelists that you have three minutes to testify. We're asking that you limit your testimony to three minutes, but as always, you can submit longer written testimony for the record. We just want to be sure we get through all to all our panelists today, and we do still have several panelists waiting to testify. I'm now going to recall Miriam Mack. Starting time. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. First, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the parents and youth who have testified today and who have resisted the family regulation system and thrived in spite of the system. My name is Miriam Mack and I'm policy counsel to the family defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. For Black and Latinx low in and low-income families in New York City, the reach of the family regulation system is vast and the disparities run deep. Today, we've heard much about ACS's kinship placement program and I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that kinship placement is still an incredible disruption of parent and child bonds. 
And it would not be acceptable for the government to come in and take our children and give them to other relatives. And indeed it's not acceptable in white communities, much less held up as a solution to racial disparities and held up as a solution to a system that should not be intervening in the lives of black and brown folks to begin with. So I think we need to think critically about that response when we're talking about and addressing ACS disparities. But I'm gonna focus my time today on mandated reporter laws, which force social service agencies to function as a de facto police of the family regulation system. These laws render Black, Latinx, and low-income communities in New York City hyper-vulnerable to family separation and disillusion. We've heard about this already today, the way in which mandated reporters expose families to the family regulation system and possible separation. Take hospitals, for example. In labor and delivery rooms, extraordinary race disparities exist in who hospitals drug test at birth and report to the family regulation system. Despite similar use of drugs among pregnant people, black pregnant people are 10 times more likely to be reported to the family regulation system for a positive drug test than white pregnant people. In pediatric emergency rooms, which you've heard about today, black children presenting with the same injuries as white children are reported to the family regulation system as alleged victims of child abuse in greater rates. Worried black parents who have brought their children in for treatment and care are treated like suspects and criminalized while white parents are met with compassion and support. In shelters managed by DHS, the threat of ACS is used to gain compliance with rules, many of which have no bearing on child maltreatment. Similarly, teachers in schools, despite the guidance that's been put out by the, the Department of Education and that ACS was speaking to today, teachers in schools are still calling ACS when our clients' children fail to log on for remote learning. But we know and we've seen in the news media that white parents can and do opt out of remote learning without fear of ACS intervention. We bear witness to the fact that Black Latinx and low-income parents are subjected to unrelenting surveillance by our social service systems. Across the city, teachers, health professionals, shelter workers, social workers, and their roles as mandated reporters report families to the family regulation system with its tools of family separation I'm expired. and inclusion, rather than providing them with the resources and support and benefits of the doubt that are provided to more privileged parents in our city. Systems meant to provide social support are used instead to control families in ways that are unheard of in white communities. Rooting out the racism, classism, and ableism that makes black children six times more likely to be involved in a report of abuse or neglect than white children cannot be solved by slight course adjustments, cannot be solved by bias trainings or tinkering with the system. We must dismantle the family regulation system, repeal mandated reporting laws, and invest in non-punitive community visions of support for families. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. I'm going to call next Helen Montalvan. Starting time. Hello. Thank you for inviting Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem to present testimony today. My name is Helen Montalban, and since 2004, I have worked as an advocate for parents being surveilled by ACS, first as a parent advocate with the Bronx Defenders, and now as a social worker at NDS Harlem. You asked us to testify regarding what you call racial disparity in child welfare. The truth is that there isn't a racial disparity in this system. The system is racist to its core and its origin and its foundation. It is not a system that addresses child welfare. It is instead a system that polices, punishes, regulates, surveils, and separates low-income Black and brown families. NDS and the other family defenders testifying today will not be referring to ACS as part of the child welfare system in the course of our testimony because that name deliberately obfuscates the history and function of this punitive system. Instead, we'll refer to it as the family regulation system. Allow me to explain why. The family regulation system has always violently policed families to conform to white supremacist social standards. It originates with the orphan trains of the late 1800s and early 1900s, when the Children's Aid Society, still in operation in New York City today, separated thousands of poor Italian and Irish immigrant children from their families and sent them to the Midwest to work on farms. As council members probably know, Italians and Irish folk were not seen as white at the time of in, in American history. Then, as now, the poverty that these children and their families experienced were framed as a personal failing instead of the structural issue it was. 
family connections in these communities were considered inferior and therefore breaking those connections were considered to their and more importantly society's benefit. Similarly, for decades, the family regulation system we fight today is rooted in this history, but its funding did not explode until Republicans and Democrats alike slashed public assistance programs in the 1980s and 1990s. These cuts happen in response to Black families gaining access to social programs through civil rights struggles. The cuts were coupled with billions of dollars in new funding for foster care. The federal foster care budget stood at less than 500 million in 1981. But to, by 2003, it was at 4.5 billion. Suddenly the family regulation had, system had new more powerful hammers. So it went out looking for nails. Family regulation agencies targeted the black community where families had already been made particularly vulnerable by the racist war on drugs and the cuts to public assistance. The cuts to public programs and the surge in money to family regulation agencies amounted to two prone attack on black families staged over 40 years and justified by racist stereotypes about black mothers. The racism behind the welfare queen trope is alive and well in 2020. It is dressed up as a neglect finding hurled at a, at a mother's a working mother by ACS as the agency adopts research from all corners, from the Federal Children's Bureau to the National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges to numbers reported by ACS itself, demonstrates that Black families are disproportionately represented in reports, investigations, and prosecutions by the family regulation system that Black children are disproportionately represented in the foster system. This is not work of a few bad apples. These outcomes demonstrate reliably and consistently across the variety of social research are a result of white supremacy and structural racism masquerading as social betterment. Until the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978, Native American children were separated from their families by the government at a very high rate and placed with white families. To this day, Native American children continue to be disproportionately separated from their families by the government. Since I began doing this work, I have seen this racism with my own eyes. White families are kept together by ACS workers and lawyers under circumstances in which black and brown families are separated. White parents are given a second chance by ACS workers and lawyers, whereas black and brown parents are treated apparently and fun fundamentally flawed. And things have gotten only worse in the 16 years that I've been advocating for families. The city must take concrete steps to improve outcomes for families. Families need early access to an independent defense advocate to mitigate the damage done by ACS and the family regulation infrastructure. The city must urge the state legislator to institute Miranda-like rights for parents that brings transparency to the family regulation system for families facing investigations unaware of their gravity. These steps are important and we urge city council to act on them now but we also note that they amount to mitigation of the most damaging tolls ACS exacts from black families. To truly reckon with this damage, we must defund the family regulation system and invest in community led programs that truly help black families. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I'll now call on Zachary Ahmad. Starting time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Zach Ahmed, and I'm a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union, the New York affiliate of the ACLU. Our mission is to promote and protect the fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution, including the guarantee of equal protection under the laws and the right to privacy and personal autonomy, including in the realm of family life. I want to thank the council for holding this hearing and providing a forum for this critical topic. This hearing looks at an important and sometimes overlooked example of racial injustice. The striking overrepresentation of black and brown families among those families caught up in the child welfare system, or as I'll refer to it, the family regulation system. The data, which you've heard and which I won't repeat, is staggering, and it reveals how children and parents of color are overrepresented throughout the various stages of the child protective process, from the calling in of a report to placement outside their homes. Those numbers merely back up what many parents, advocates, and legal service, services providers know firsthand and have reflected in some of the testimony today. This is a system that overwhelmingly impacts and in many ways punishes parents and children of color and women of color in particular. If you spend time in the child neglect parts of any of the city's family courts, you will see these disparities with your own eyes, as well as the frustration and desperation that many parents and children 
face in trying to navigate these systems. The problem of racial disparities in the family regulation system is complex with deep roots in the country and the city's history. And addressing these disparities will require solutions that are not easy and not piecemeal and will involve multiple levels of government. Above all, we appreciate the opportunity today to learn from the other panelists about their ideas and visions for addressing these issues. And we look forward to working with the advocacy community and the council on moving forward with these matters. But while, the systemic, while systemic problems require systemic responses, the city council can take initial steps by moving forward with legislation that has already been before it some time now, for some time now. Uh, almost one year ago today exactly, uh, this committee held a hearing where it discussed a package of legislation designed to uncover better information about the family regulation system and expand parents' due process rights. Excuse me. Those bills remain laid over in committee. One of those bills, Intro 1717 of 2019, would require ACS to report out detailed demographic, demographic information regarding each stage of the child protective process which would give us more detailed data that would reveal the true depth of these disparities and provide a groundwork for more robust policy uh, solutions. Other bills in the package, which uh, are identified more specifically in our, the written testimony we'll submit, would begin the process of making the existing system fairer for the families it impacts. Among other things, the bills would make sure that parents have information about their rights when they're interacting with ACS, the beginning stages of an investigation, something akin to a Miranda warning that exists in the criminal context, begin to provide early access to counsel in the course of, a child, of course of child protective matters so that parents' rights are not compromised um, and require comprehensive reporting on how drug testing of pregnant people at public hospitals leads to child protective investigations. Uh, these bills certainly do not comprise all that must be done to reimagine the system or address the racial disparities within it. And some of these bills could potentially benefit from further workshopping with advocates to make sure they work as intended. Uh, but they do represent an important first step and we implore the council to resume work on them without delay. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Zach, for your testimony. Now call on Karen Friedman to deliver testimony. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Levin and the General Welfare Committee for your incredible patience today and for holding this hearing. I'm Karen Friedman, the Executive Director at Lawyers for Children. I am going to do my best to be brief and focus on just one aspect of the full written testimony we've submitted to the committee. By way of background, Lawyers for Children was founded in 1984. We're a not-for-profit legal corporation employing attorneys and social workers to advocate for our young clients on every single case. We represent children in voluntary foster care, abuse, neglect, termination of parental rights, adoption, custody, and guardianship proceedings in family court, and advocate for system-wide reform to improve the lives of children in foster care. On average, we represent children and youth in more than 6,000 court proceedings each year. So as promised, I'm just gonna focus on one aspect of our testimony, and that's reducing bias influence in mandated SCR reports. While the number of children in foster care has declined dramatically during the last several years, the number of black and Latinx children brought to the front door of the child regulation system or child welfare system through reports to the statewide central registry has remained essentially unchanged. And this is not without consequence. Once a report is received, caseworkers may be dispatched to interview children in the middle of the night. Children may be pulled out of their classrooms in front of their peers for questioning. They may be subject to physical exams and temporarily removed from their families. All of these actions, even if the report is ultimately unfounded, will have a lasting negative impact on a child. Research shows that although black children are far more likely to be reported for suspected abuse and neglect than white children, they are in fact no more likely to actually have been maltreated. It has been said, and Ms. Ta Ms. Thomas's testimony points out vividly, that a white child who appears at a hospital with a broken arm goes home with a cast and a lollipop, but black child who appears at a hospital with a broken arm goes home with a cast, a lollipop, and a CPS investigation. A majority of SCR reports are made by mandated reporters, teachers, doctors, social services workers. 
Of the 16,000 reports received in 2018, close to 12,000 were made by mandated reporters. And these are made mostly in New York City by employees of city agencies, including the Department of Education, the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the Department of Homeless Services, and the Human Resources Administration. As such, those agencies play a significant role in the overrepresentation of children in color in this. Time expired. Now is the time to engage all of the other city agencies to train their mandated reporters to consider whether a referral to a food bank, a daycare provider, a mental health service, an after school program, or any other community based child support could eliminate the perceived risk and do away with the need to make a call to the SCR. This is the only way we can begin to transition from the role of mandated reporters to what we should have in our communities, mandated supporters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, for your testimony. I'm now gonna call on our next panel in the following order. We will have testifying Trisha Stevens, Jamel Robinson, Kieran Malpe, and we'll recall Don Mitchell. We'll begin with Trisha Stevens. Starting time. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to the council members for being patient. Um, this has been uh, an incredible afternoon of testimony that is much needed. I'm going to start off by saying that uh, when I first saw the name for the hearing in place of um, disproportionality, I actually inserted what I understood to be racism and child welfare. Uh, to be very clear, research has shown that above all else, race and particularly being black is a predictor of child welfare involvement. This includes when poverty is taken into account, uh, when all else is equal and the offenses that are, um, uh, are alleged against parents all else being equal, being black is the strongest predictor of child welfare uh, involvement. That comes out of work from Alan Detlaff's um, group uh, that of researchers as well. Um, just to support that additionally, that when child welfare workers who are investigating share the race of the family being investigated when both are black, still being black is the strongest predictor of being placed in child welfare. So we cannot get away from the fact that what we are looking at and we're calling it disproportionality is in fact racism within the child welfare system. That's the overarching issue. In my research, I'm an assistant professor at Hunter College at um, Silverman School of Social Work. In my research, I've been in the field talking to parents for over eight years at this point in time. And what does that look like? I was moved almost to tears by Ms. Ms. Thomas's testimony um, because her testimony was from June. Um, I conducted interviews in 2014 of mothers who took their children to the hospital for care and left in handcuffs. Their child didn't go home with them with a CPS worker when they became understandably enraged that their child was being retained from their care they were removed from the hospital in handcuffs, taken to the police department, arrested, and their child was placed in foster care. This happened in 2014. I spoke to a mother in January. This happened in January of this year where a mother was removed from the hospital after having just taken, voluntarily taken her child to the hospital for care and recognizing that her child was going to be retained and she was not going home with her child. Both moms that I'm referring to were black mothers and when they expressed legitimate emotional distress, their distress seemed to upset the providers so much so that the police were called. If this is not a regular system, then I don't know what it is. I wanna just follow up with, um, uh, Dr. Dorothy Roberts's work that talks about the child welfare and family court system as America's apartheid system. If anyone has gone to the courtrooms in New York City and observed, you will see distinct lines and who goes through each line. 
And it's hard to argue that this is not our apartheid system. And I wanna go through with thinking about how South Africa deconstructed its apartheid system. It did not do so through bias trainings. It had to recognize that what was happening in the country was unacceptable, dismantling it, calling for truth and reconciliation. So those that were harmed by the system would be able to look in the eyes of those who had harmed them in the first step towards healing. And that way we can get to a point if we are truly to help parents and families get through some of the challenges we're talking about, if we're truly to build trust, we have to do some healing, we have to do some dismantling of the system because the system has earned the distrust of families and it cannot move forward without addressing those challenges. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Um, I just, um... La. Sorry, I, just, I have my La. my kids here at the La. moment, so I'm I'm off screen, but I'm I'm here La. listening. So it's a little chaotic here, but I'm here. Now I'm going to call on Jamel Robinson, followed by Kieran Malpe, followed by Don Mitchell. Jamel Robinson, for testimony. Starting time. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Levin, uh, to the committee. Thank you for having me on this afternoon. Thank you for, to all those who have taken the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think it's important for me to note for the record, over the past few days, I had the opportunity to research a litany of policy reports on the topic of racial disparities in the child welfare system that spans nearly 35 years and has predated my tenure in the child welfare, New York City child welfare system. My hope for testifying before you today is to add value, hopefully, to this discourse uh, that can help move us beyond this conversation to some actual, actionable solutions. My name is Jamel Robinson. I'm a former foster youth and the executive director of the Jamel Robinson Child Welfare Reform Initiative a 501c3 nonprofit ensuring New York City foster youth have access to the school's resources, opportunities, and support they need to receive, to re, they need to reach their full potential and achieve their highest aspirations. As a former foster youth with lived experience in the New York City foster care system, I know all too well the challenges that foster youth face and the systemic issues and racism, as well as the pervasive unconscious bias associated with such system. With the, while ACS has cited much about their work, about the impact of SCR investigations and its racial disparities in the child welfare system affecting foster youth, specifically around the impact those investigations have with regard to assessment, surveillance, and more. What ACS did not mention, which I was uh, disheartened about um, and, and, and particularly shocked, um, is that we did not mention the, the racial disparities in the child welfare system with regard to mental health, foster youth access and opportunity, and funding equity for grassroots nonprofits on the ground reaching these communities. We believe that initiative, visualization, and naturalization are the keys to unlock brighter futures for foster youth. With up to 80% of, of foster youth suffering from a significant mental health issue, both diagnosed and undiagnosed, represent a significant social problem across this country. Within the foster care system, the problem has reached epidemic proportions. Time and again, research uh, has shown foster youth continue to struggle with mental health challenges at significant highly, higher rates that they, than compared to their non-foster care peers. Yet, little has been done to improve these outcomes. Foster youth really deserve better. We look at the dis disparities with, uh, when it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder, um, higher than those who have transitioned uh, for war veterans who have transitioned from Iraq. We look at major depressive episodes on an all-time high. We look at a panic disorder. We look at social phobia. We look at alcoholic, uh, uh, alcohol dependence, I stand corrected. And while these statistics may seem bleak, we, we know to be equally true is that foster youth have gifts, talents, and abilities 
and that with the right support, they can lead to helping them achieve boundless outcomes. And around emotional wellness outcomes and mental health, ACS must, one, strengthen prevention and crisis response. Two, enhance access to timely, high quality emotional health, mental health services, education and support to older and transition age foster youth. Three, increase physical, uh, physical health services and activities available to older and transition age youth. And four, provide solutions on how New York City can improve health equity and emotional wellness outcomes of foster youth. And when we look at foster youth opportunity, we like to think of New York as a meritocracy, where every youth has an opportunity to success. In some ways, this does hold true to access, opportunity, and exclusivity. And yet, there are still areas in which equality is lacking and no more, uh, more apparent than the, the disparities th that face youth in foster care. We look at the numbers, they're stacked against foster youth. Education, only 3% will earn a college degree. Housing, roughly one in five will be homeless by age 18. Unemployment, 50% will be unemployed by at age 24. Uh, mental health, up to 80% suffer from a significant mental health issue. Prison, 25% of foster youth will transition uh, uh, from foster care uh, and uh, post their transition two years after emancipation uh, had some involvement with the cr criminal justice system. We, it's time to flip the script. And our brand of hope is derived from the conviction that foster youth are worth our collective investments, investments that match our belief and their potential rooted in equity tenets, with, which include access to high quality health, uh, high quality health care, education, supportive housing, career opportunities, mentorship, financial literacy, and tangible support. I conclude here. And funding opportunities. We see inequity and unconscious bias manifested when, for example, you can visit a foundation website with a mission to reduce poverty and proceed to apply for a grant. And as a small grassroots nonprofit organization, you are automatically disqualified because your organization does not meet the annual budget requirement. Or even worse, you get to the site and you are met with a sentence in red that reads, no unsolicited proposals accept accepted. Both are discriminatory practices. Both suggest you must have quote unquote access. One infers you must have access to physical resources, whereas the other, social capital. The challenge with both is that in government contracting, ACS, and philanthropy, it is known in most instances the organizations, these organizations are led by individuals of color with limited access to the kinds of physical resources in social networks more readily accessible to their white contemporaries. But we also know that these organizations are the ones on the front lines, day in and day out. They know the community, they are impacted by the community and they are the leaders uh, uh, that uh, are no less credentialed, if not more. And often those with lived experiences effectuating the change, the change in the same community that are adversely impacted. They are the experts, yet regardless of this recognition, Instead of the proposals being judged on its merits, they are essentially told their contributions are not welcome. This is for the privileged. To create funding equity and access, ACS must support nonprofit grassroots organizations in the area of capacity grants that will allow for equitable access and funding that can enhance programming aimed at the prevention of system involvement and a central component to reducing CSR cases brought to ACS. I am going to really conclude there, but I will say, I will caution this, this committee and this city. One of the major issues, and I prophesy, I pretty much declare this to, to be so, and I know it to be true all too well, given my lived experience uh, in the foster care system. The, the next challenge, the next wave we're going to face as a city and as a nation really is around, as we have been in times past, around emotional wellness. Young people are gonna transition out of this system um, and they will be continue to deal with the challenges or navigate the complexities of this thing called life, yeah. no matter what supports you provide to them. But if we don't focus on the mental health 
outcomes of our young people in this system. We are doing a disservice. Jamel, I think that, Jamel, I think that, um, Jamel? So, Jamel, oh. you're muted. Jamel, I think you've been mute. Jamel? Uh, Jamel, I think that you're muted. Jamel, can you hear me? I think you're muted. But I think you're muted. Can you unmute? There you go. Jamel, thank thank you so much. I it's it's great to see you. It's been a while, um, but I thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, and and I uh, look forward to to seeing you much. It's been too long, so let's let's make sure we reconnect. Yes, we will. Great, great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jamel. I'll now call on Karen Malpe, followed by Don Mitchell. Starting time. Hello, my name is Karen Malpe. I'm, can you hear me now? We hear you. Great. Okay. I said I was muted. Sorry. Hi, my name is Kieran. I'm a clinical social worker with the Center for Core Innovation. And I thank you today for your time and for the opportunity to speak. As we look for solutions and needed shifts in practice, I would like to tell you about an innovative evidence-based problem-solving infant-focused family court model called the Strong Starts Court Initiative. So Chair Levin, after seeing you, I hope this is meaningful to you. Um, Strong Starts responds to the unique needs of children aged birth to three during their most receptive and formative stage of development who become subject, child, subject children in child protection proceedings in family court. In addition to the racial disparities that are well known in child welfare, babies are also disproportionately represented in family court with over 10,000 cases for children under three across New York City in 2018. The Strong Starts model addresses intergenerational system involvement through a consistent, collaborative, and clinical approach, engaging all service systems. The model aims to improve family court and child welfare practices by utilizing a strengths-based framework in an otherwise punitive system. We do this by engaging and including families early on in the court process and by conducting comprehensive clinical assessments to determine tailored service plans for families based on their identified needs and by utilizing infant focused and relational interventions that are not typically included on service plans. We view each family's unique experience through a clinical lens that focuses on attachment relationships and ruptures that have occurred. We address the very real experiences of intergenerational trauma, systemic racism and historical trauma as part of an individual's social context and therefore their clinical presentation, which often reflects the pain and despair that often underlies uncooperative or other confusing parental responses to child welfare system practitioners and demands. We work to engage high quality providers across all service areas that serve each family's community in an effort to ensure access and connection to effective treatment to mit mitigate identified risks, support strengthening family relationships and healing as well as address any barriers to accessing these services. We also engage service providers in understanding what the family court process is like for parents to provide insight as to why they might be resistant to engaging or sharing information for fear it may harm their case, as well as hoping that once providers have a true understanding of what family court is like, this will be taken into account when considering making future reports to the SER or other families. Of most significance, is our monthly conferencing structure that convenes all parties, most importantly, the family and baby when possible, legal part parties and service providers. We bring them together to share updates, brainstorm how to remove barriers and mitigate risks and celebrate progress in an effort to bring cases to resolution in a timely manner and expedite permanency for children in out of home care to promote positive outcomes for families. Clinical conferences also aim to ensure that parents' voices are heard and respected and to reduce stress for families in the family court that can at times be re-traumatizing. This contracts with the current standard and typical proceedings of inconsistent durations of adjournments between convenings of parties. 
Strong Starts works to maintain child and family stability and to create a system in which parents can reach out when they need help without fear of punishment. Strong Starts is a mean to increase access and equity for families and a way to mitigate racial disparities in the child welfare system. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Kieran. And now I'm gonna call on Don Mitchell, recall Don Mitchell, who previously had technical difficulties with audio. Thank you, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, um, thank you for your patience and thank you for recalling me. My name is Don Mitchell, I'm the attorney in charge of the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. We represent approximately 34,000 children uh, who are at the center of abuse and neglect cases in the family court system in New York City. Thank you, Chair Levin, for organizing today's hearing and for giving us an opportunity to share our testimony. I also appreciate the opportunity to hear from colleagues, advocates, parents, and uh, youth today, as well as ACS. I believe the conversation uh, is much needed and I appreciated the comments that were made and suggestions uh, that were offered. We support the efforts of the city that the city has made and continues to make to address very serious issue of racial disparities in the child welfare system. First, we have to reckon with the fact that our current child welfare system is the product of our country's history of anti-Blackness, among other harmful racially charged injustices. This history isn't behind us. And we've learned that more so today than perhaps ever before. It is one of the driving factors behind families of color being disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. I agree with Joyce McMillan who said that poverty is a significant factor uh, in the racially disproportionate data in the child welfare system. The poverty that families, black and brown, children experience in New York City is amplified by their exposure to social services systems, which further increases their exposure to mandated reporters. The statistics tell the story very clearly. For example, and I think we heard it briefly uh, today by uh, Dr. White, uh, that, or Andrew White rather, um, black children in New York City are six times more likely to be reported to the SDR uh, as white children. The report is 7.8 times more likely to be indicated and the child is 12.8 times more likely to be admitted into foster care. And this is data uh, contained by OCFS. Um, these numbers are not accidental. They reflect a system that places many black and Latinx parents under the unremitting stress of poverty, racial stereotypes, and hyper surveillance. This disproportionate system causes severe and long standing harm to children and their families. And almost exclusively, these are children of color, Black children primarily. Uh, while ACS has worked to address this disproportionality, there is far more work to be done and far more work that Time must be done. I just wanna offer that it was encouraging to hear from ACS that it will begin planning uh, pursuant to the OCFS mandate to implement race blind assessments. Uh, Chair Levin, you asked a very key question and I really believe that uh, race blind assessments are a critical uh, component to reducing uh, disproportionality in filing of cases in family court as well as removal of children. And there is quantitative data available that Nassau County can produce. ACS also mentioned its use um, or its uh, the prevalence and increased use of primary prevention services during the pandemic. Quite instructive that during the pandemic, while the filings were lower because of the reduced access to the court, there has not been an outcry of abuse or significantly harmed children across the city. And there was a comment that the commissioner made that I take, um, I take issue with. He said, we'll just have to see. I think more than anything, what is very telling is that the 
emphasis of primary preventive services have actually shown that they work, that they reduce the incidence and the need to file cases and the need for ACS's intervention in families' lives. I would ask the city council to call on transparent data and analysis of case outcomes. It's needed. We need to look at every decision point and find the issues that are leading to racial disparities beyond uh, the moment when the child, when the case is open. And I believe a closer look at the investigation process is important. You have to look at this data and it has to get, it has to show that in fact, the training that the commissioner mentioned today is actually proving to make a difference. Uh, the strategy ACS mentioned today certainly highlights good work, thoughtful considerations, um, and if implemented, may make a difference. However, we strongly believe that these efforts must be measured and this data must be available. And perhaps independent auditors should be uh, used to evaluate the effectiveness of, this ser of these services. And finally, as we look at the learned lessons, perhaps of this period, of this very challenging period of the pandemic, um, the reduction of filings, we're looking, we're also considering the fact that with reduced filings, there's been an emphasis and more opportunity to focus on reunification of those cases where the children have been removed. This is another opportunity to look at the racial disparities uh, and actually course, con course con correct. Um, that's all that I have today. Thank you again for holding this hearing and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell, for your testimony. At this point- Is there anyone, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amanda. If we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, you can right now use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised if we've missed anybody who signed up to testify today. Okay, seeing none, um, I want to thank everybody for your amazing patience. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Stevens, are you indicating? Oh, I think you're muted. I believe Alyssa McCoy is uh, raising her hand. Oh, okay. She didn't use oh, yes. Her. Okay, oh. yes. Okay, <laughs> Alyssa McCoy. Hi, my name is Elisa McCoy. Oh, uh, thank you for giving me a few minutes. I know it's late. I testified last year at the hearing at City Hall. Uh, I am a parent affected by ACS. And um, what I will tell you, it is not a family deregulation system. It is more like the administrative mafia, the way they conduct themselves and in the manner in which they do have access to children. Okay, the investigative process is adversarial, there's no due process. I am a cancer, 9-11 certified cancer patient and, that is, and I am guilty of accepting treatment for chemo and radiation to stay alive to be with my children. At which point there had been uh, an allegation put in with no basis, no investigation. My, children, my two 14 year old children were removed without any investigation or contacted or, or their pediatrician was never contacted they didn't even know about my oldest son. They removed the children and brought them to a hospital to be examined by a strange doctor to only then learn I had joint custody with my husband. So there was no investigation done. I asserted my right to counsel. It was ignored. The NYPD and ACS came to my home without a warrant, without a 1034 F, you know, filed in family court without any investigation to be done and removed my children. After that, after they were taken to the hospital, examined by a strange doctor, there was nothing wrong. They then had to return them to my husband, which we already had custody of. This has been going since 2017. Okay, I've challenged them in court. I'm in family court and Supreme Court. I'm holding them accountable. 
the caseworker ACS Sue Ann Simmons, uh, I, from my understanding, was she called me cuckoo for cocoa puffs in front of two court officers outside of family court who told me to go file a police report on her. Once I made the report, it was retaliation, and I believe she was promoted. Okay, I don't know what kind of bias training they have in ACS, but this kept this is ongoing. ACS continues in my life because I challenged the case and I had it vacated for a neglect finding, which there was not even an allegation of how I was neglectful. I'm going forward with this. And during the COVID, when it first started, the April um, ACS high risk notice that David Hansel mentioned, I wanted to know why I was still considered a high risk case. They came to my home nonstop every two weeks, as they still do, my children are almost 18. They come to my home every two weeks, even though there's no allegations, nothing. It was just a technical procedure that reopened the case in family court. So I don't know, they said there was ACS, Hansel said he was gonna review all the cases that were Time high expired. risk, there were no cases reviewed. Okay, I don't understand why my case is still open, how it still goes on. The council has not complied with discovery demands for four years. I still continue with this. There's no due process. It's unconstitutional. And they harass families nonstop until they're held, held accountable. There's nobody to police themselves with. You know, when you call, I called to complain about the ACS caseworker who's not a social worker, but instead is the judge, jury, and, and the police officer in the case who calls into the SCR and finds me indicated after the family court judge said there was there is no indication. So it, it's, it's like double jeopardy. And I'm spending my own funds to fight SCR, which the judges are employed by OCFS and everybody, it, it's a very one-sided way. So now I'm in Supreme Court on an Article 78 hearing and in family court at the same time. And they're offering me an ACD, which I politely declined because I'm not neglectful. I never neglected my children. And once you admit to any of these services, once you accept any of their services, which I never have, it's like admitting guilt. So they're taking federal funding in order to do this. It just, I've learned so much about the system that defies the constitution. And simply, if they just give you your rights, the parental rights in the beginning, anything you say can and will be twisted against you. And that's what I've learned. And the ACS caseworker, Sue Ann Simmons has perjured herself more than once. My children record everything. I record everything that has went on. So the, what they say, and David Hansel himself had rubber stamped a complaint, a petition order against me. And I think qualified immunity should be removed. And when you know these people are held accountable, when their pensions are on the line for it, they'll think more, You know, instead of destroying a family's life, and doing that, if their pensions are on the line and they're not immune to it, they'll, you know, they'll think twice about just, just taking people's children without any, without any reason or investigation. You know, it's, it's, it's a nightmare I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I don't want this to happen to any other families. So without Miranda rights and any due process, it, 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 this cannot continue. This cannot continue. And last year, uh, Chair Levin, you did ask ACS David Hansel to release the board meeting minutes for ACS, and he declined to release them. In those meetings, I have a, in that meeting that he declined to release, uh, there was definitely a disparity of race because I got an off the record, and once he refused to do that, that I was just a checkbox. It's all I was was a checkbox of uh, my race that I was white and that's why they were gonna hold on to my case until my children turned 18, which is now true. I know I've covered a lot and I've skipped around a lot, but this has been almost four years without any allegations that are true that can stick. And I have supporting documentation for every single thing I say, I say with vindication. And I intend on holding each and every person accountable, especially, I want to know with this bias training, how does the caseworker Sue Ann Simmons get away with calling someone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and then get promoted within ACS? I, I'm just, my case is still open and they're not willing to let it go. 
you know, because they, they want me to spend my money on attorneys. They do not care about wasting their own resources, uh, their own agency's resources, time, and, and the courts. They all work for the same person, the mayor. Okay, they're all employed. It's a very one-sided system. But when you challenge them, you got to hold them accountable, which I'm trying to do. And they're, you, you know, they have endless resources where I'm just one person, you know, trying to hold some kind of accountability. And in the memorandum, they, they even know it's unconstitutional to question children in our uh, uh, county, uh, our county, New York. They send a memo to DFS to do business as usual, even though it's unconstitutional to to uh, question a child in their school without parental consent until a decision is held by a higher judge, an oral report, every other county continue to question children without parental consent, except for Orange County, New York, which to me, it just, they know they're wrong, but they're gonna continue to do it until a higher judge says so. Mr. Point, I think we, we, have to, we have to wrap up, but no, I, 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 I greatly appreciate the testimony and, and um, I appreciate you telling your story and I, I, I do wish you and your family the, the best and please feel free to keep in touch with me as well. Uh, please, please follow up with me. I mean, I've been doing this since last year. I tried to contact yeah. your office. You supposed to follow up last year. Elizabeth Adams, I believe, was the, my contact. We'll if follow up. We'll it's scheduled in December. This, this goes on. My kids are almost 18, so I don't know how much longer ACS will continue this, this farce. No, thank, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, okay, and uh, is there any, anyone else that wishes to testify? Okay, well, seeing none, sorry, this is the only way I can keep him quiet. So um, uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for, for your testimony. I mean, the, the, we have a, a tremendous amount of work uh, ahead of us, um, and you have my commitment as the chair of this committee, hopefully for the next year, but no more than that, um, uh, or 14 months, that, that um, you have my commitment that I'll, I'll do everything I can to address as many of these issues as we can uh, uh, systematically and, and through legislation. So um, I thank you all for this, uh, your testimony in this, um, I think very, very uh, productive hearing. Um, and with that at 5.54 p.m. This